Chapter One of Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord S. J. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord S. J. Chapter One Perhaps the only joke in the whole strange experience was the fact that I, Luke Foster, should be mixed up with arrows. Gunnery is my specialty, the most modern of modern gunnery, anti-aircraft fire. And then into my life comes a flight of medieval arrows. I had been working, on army assignment, on something new in projectiles, always with the latest type of aviation gunner in mind. And then out of history, and apparently out of the black earth, pops the scarlet archer of Agincourt. If you remember your history, you recall that the Battle of Agincourt, in which archers won their greatest triumph, took place quite a few moons ago. Incidentally, I have spent most of the twenty-six years of my still happily young life bragging that I'd be keen to see a ghost. Then, when one turned up... But I mustn't anticipate my story. We'll come to all that in the proper order. I had packed my bag and instructed an orderly to have it put on the northbound train. The thought of my two weeks' leave was enough to make me turn cartwheels, if the regulations had permitted cartwheels to artillery captains. In fact, I didn't even mind that for two weeks the experiments on our magnetic bullets would be at a standstill. When I commented on this to Sergeant Willoughby, he grinned and pointed to my briefcase packing to bursting point with papers. Then why, Captain, he asked politely, but with due irony, are you lugging all the drawings and plans along with you? Wilhelmy wasn't just an ordinary sergeant. Even in those days it was my calm conviction that some day, soon, he'd be sitting at a polished desk and giving me orders. Wilhelmy had taken his Ph.D. in physics at Marquette, where they talked for many a day about the experiments he developed in ballistics. He'd been assigned to work with me on what might be either a crack-brained idea or something very important in the defense program. And we were, the three of us, great friends and fellow enthusiasts. But I haven't mentioned the third of us, Tim Erkenwold, first lieutenant now on his leave. If you'd like me to, Willamy suggested tentatively, I'll work over that batch of mathematics while you're gone. And grab all the credit for the job? We joshed each other man-fashion, and enjoyed our intramural insults. Not on your life. If any credit comes out of this thing, it comes to the officers, not to some upstart non-com. But five minutes later, Wilhelmy and I, in defiance of train time, were poring over the duplicate set of drawings I decided to leave with him, and we were plotting out the work he'd do during the weeks of my absence. I can't give you many of the details of our work, the government has tucked it in with the other military secrets. I'll just mention that the three of us were working on a new principle in gunnery. Normally, a bullet finds its objective with merely the assistance of the gun that fires it, and the men who sight the gun. We had brought into play, at least on paper, and in a few limited experiments, a new factor. The tremendous amount of metal in a modern plane, plus the vast quantities of electricity that is constantly generated by that metal, could give a force that might we thought, help guide the bullet to its objective. Why couldn't bullets be drawn as well as propelled? If, we argued, we could develop small, highly explosive shells that could not only be shot from a gun pointed in a definite direction, but be drawn by the metal plane towards the objective. Crudely put, that was our job. And, as I say, we knew that on a small scale it worked. Bullets could be aimed at a metal objective but our magnetized bullets could then be pulled on their course by the force of attraction in the moving plane. To the accuracy of the gun, and to the direction given the bullet by the men who sight the gun, we had added another element, the magnetic pull of the moving plane. The chances of hitting enemy bombers would, when the invention was perfected, be vastly increased. So, I say, we hoped. Great Scott! I cried, looking at my wristwatch. Train time! I picked up my briefcase, gave Will and me a pat on the shoulder, flung open the door of our little lab, and almost bumped into an orderly. 
I came to an abrupt and undignified halt. Captain Foster, he said, and asked in a breath, special delivery letter and package. I grabbed them both, signed rapidly, and tore for the car that was to carry me to my train and a much-needed vacation. I still find it hard to think of holidays as leaves. They're vacations to me, army or no army. As the car sped toward the station, I slid open the letter with my thumb. The handwriting on the envelope was Tim Erkenwold's. The postmark was the little town where the Erkenwold estate was located. I am sure my eyes popped as I read the letter. It was brief, but Tim wasn't much of a letter writer. What he said now was plenty. Dear Luke, here I come to gum up your leave, but will you spend the two weeks with me here at Arrow Anchorage? I can't offer you much by way of fun, and I know your heart is set on New York and the bright lights, but old man, I need you. It's terribly important that you come. Would you be amused if I said that I am frightened? Perhaps your ghost-hunting soul will impel you to do what you'd otherwise avoid, for I'm not joking when I tell you that the scarlet archer walks again. Please come, Tim. So when I bought my ticket at the little station, which was now swelled to importance by the bulging camp that had attached itself to a normally somnolent village, it read, not New York, but the little town near Arrow Anchorage. If Tim wrote like that, it was important that I go to him. We'd been pals ever since our freshman days at Fordham, so what could I do but deflect in his direction? Forgive me if I do not name the town or even the state. These are dangerous days. One can talk but not too explicitly. Democratic freedom permits talk. Democratic danger prohibits too detailed information. But this much I can tell, and I will. I was heading for a section of the Atlantic coast, where the ocean is normally fairly calm, and where along the steep and rocky shore American colonists, way back in the seventeenth century, had anchored their estates. They had brought from England a host of English customs, from butlers to fox hunting, from a taste for tea to a love of liberty, and the intervening centuries had changed the customs not at all. But the national emergency had made one change in the district. Slightly to the south of the Erkenwold estate, Arrow Anchorage was another little town situated on what had been, in its day, one of the busiest ports of the Yankee Clippers. After a hundred years of tourists and tea shops and artist colonies, the town had suddenly grown tremendously important. An enormous airfield had been leveled off back of the town a base for naval aviation, and the Coast Guard artillery had dug in, built up, and behind their new fortifications started the installation of the biggest guns our arsenals could provide. The train cut through the early autumn landscapes at express speed. I like trains. They make me feel relaxed and at ease. Being in the artillery, I should, I suppose, prefer to ride in an armored tank. I don't. I like the luxury of a Pullman, and the complete isolation possible to a man who thrust a book between himself and the rest of the traveling public. But this time I couldn't precisely relax. Tim's letter had been almost like a cryptogram, thrown my way, a cipher packed with meaning, if only one had the missing key. The curiosity and even the slight anxiety I felt about Tim served as file clerk to drag up out of my memory all I could remember about Tim Erkenwold and his life story. He had told it to me in dribs and drabs during the winter evenings in St. John's Hall at Fordham. He talked especially long and revealingly when he got word that Christopher, his only brother, had been killed on a wild animal hunt in Africa. That was five years ago, our senior year. He took Christopher's death hard. Evidently that brother had been a grand chap, interested in everything from amateur dramatics to big game hunting, from expert tennis to Catholic action. Oh, yes, Tim's family had brought the faith with them from Tudor England, and they had lost none of it along the way of the centuries. Tim's father, retired shipping tycoon, James Emerson Erkenwold, had taken his son's death almost stoically. Even the fact that his eldest son and the heir to the anchorage had been buried in the jungles of Africa had not moved him to resentment or bitterness. Tim said his father made a public act of faith before the friends who came to prod him on to resentment, sent them away with wonder in their eyes and a slightly deeper sense of a Catholic's attitude toward death. Three years later, when he had finished his doctorate in physics, Tim wrote me briefly. An uncle who had been with Chris on that fatal big game hunt had come to live with him. He had escaped with his life when the rhino had charged, 
but he was a helpless cripple, condemned, by the accident that had killed the younger man, to spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. I could tell from Tim's first letter that he didn't go in strong for Uncle Henry Forsyth Erkenwold. Should be called Frostbite, he wrote semi-humorously. Well, Tim and I were together in the government laboratories the following year, just twelve months before this strange and adventurous leave, when Tim's father died. Tim arrived too late to see him alive, but not too late for the reading of the will. That will was a blow from which after twelve months he had not yet recovered, for while his father had left him a moderately comfortable annuity that was to last as long as he lived, and make him independent, though far from rich, heir or anchorage, and the bulk of his property he had left to his younger brother, Uncle Henry Forsyth Erkenwold. When Tim came back he didn't refer to the will. Certainly he knew that I'd read in the papers the story of what seemed almost like a father's disowning of his son. Instead, he plunged into our intensely accurate work with just a sincere thank you to my condolence. It wasn't until three months later that he broke down. He had been, he confessed, stunned. It's not, he said, that I care a snap for the money, Luke. You know that. Of course I love Arrow Anchorage. It's been handed down from father to son since the first Catholic Erkenwold fled England for the colonies. Naturally, I wish it were mine. But what hurts is that my father did this to me. He must have loved his younger brother, who after all had spent almost all his life in Europe and Africa better than he loved me. He preferred him to have the anchorage, as if he'd take better care of the place, its traditions, its memories, and history, yes, its future, than I would. I talked the inanities with which we tried to explain the inexplicable and to console the inconsolable. Finally, I did toss him a straw of hope. This uncle of yours has no heirs, I said. In the long run, the property will probably come to you anyhow. Tim looked at me as if he were hurt by my obtuseness. Would I want to inherit from my uncle what my father preferred me not to have? That settled that. Three months later, a gossip columnist writing in a New York paper presented the gawking world, and Tim and me, with an amazing bit of news. Madame Vivian Leclerc once was the toast, or so we hear, of the Paris Opera House. The toast is on fire once more. She has been seen in the best restaurants and at all the better plays with Henry Forsyth Erkenwold, whose famous arrow anchorage could do with a charming mistress. Anyhow, if we were the master of A.A., we'd rather have our wheelchair propelled by the fascinating Leclerc than by the far from attractive bodyguard and valet, who now shoves it around. I found Tim reading the column thoughtfully. He wanted to talk, and he did. If his uncle married, then his, Tim's, claims on the anchorage were gone forever. For on the principle of there being no fool like an old fool, if Uncle Henry attached himself to a collapsed actress, it wasn't likely that he would deny her the future security which might make up for a crippled husband. The train gave a sudden, unexplained jolt, and down from the rack, where the porter had carelessly balanced it, slipped the special delivery package that had accompanied the leather. I had forgotten about it. Now I tore it open, and found that the wrappings contained an old-fashioned book, the pages yellow and loose, the binding of heavy leather, which had long since begun to rot. It was one of those early nineteenth-century histories of an American family, with hand engravings of stiff-looking men and relaxed-looking ladies in formidable buildings surrounded by the most starched of formal gardens. The History of the Erkenwold Family, read the title, the book bore no author's name. I skipped the pages that told the early story of the Erkenwolds in England, their coming to their religious refuge in America, their building of arrow anchorage to reproduce as far as possible the ancestral mansion they had lost because of their faith. Then I noticed that Tim, evidently the sender of the book, had indicated one section for my attention. On a sheet of foolscap he had written, This may interest you. The chapter was headed, The Scarlet Archer of the Erkenwold. I synopsized the stilted and tiresomely written passages, though I confess that I read them with consuming interest. Tim had once told me, jokingly, of the legend of the Scarlet Archer, and though, as I have already confessed, my tongue fairly hangs out, or it did hang out, at the thought of seeing a ghost, I paid scant attention to the apparently ridiculous tale. But here it was in cold print. The first of the Erkenwolds, the writer explained, had been an archer at Agincourt, when, with the flying arrows of his English bowman, Henry V, 
into the dominance of the mailed and armored knights after the battle henry had knighted a score of these archers among them the ancestor of the erkenwolds scarlet was his jerkin wrote the author with stilted inversions and red were its arrows from that memorable hour the scarlet archer became not only the forebear of the long line of noble erkenwolds but the prototype on which was fashioned the family ghost then the writer went on with the legend of the family ghost as long as the family remained in england tradition held that the death of an important erkenwold was heralded by the apparition of the scarlet archer rising against the sky the author continued usually on a gently sloping hill within the ancestral domain and usually within easy eyeshot of the mansion the scarlet archer would appear he was always clad like the first of the erkenwolds at agincourt whenever he lifted his bow and shot an arrow into the air a red arrow that showed bloodily against the moon death was stalking an erkenwold death that would strike within a month its deadly arrow-like blow here tim had penciled faintly note when this happened each member of the family was measured for a coffin the count that followed i again synopsized when the family fled to america they thought they were leaving the scarlet archer behind ghosts do not as a rule cross the water with the families that claim them not so this scarlet archer the writer continued rumor hath it that more than once in america both in colonial days and since these united states have raised their proud heads along the atlantic sea coast the scarlet archer on several well authenticated occasions again tim had scratched in pencil i read it with difficulty a month ago i should have laughed at this to-day the train paused and i glanced out of the window we were skirting the boundaries of the magnificent flying field and i could make out between me and the ocean contours and shapes of land that might have escaped a lay eye to me they indicated coast artillery emplacements with a feeling of real pride i took in what i could see of barracks and shops and the varied equipment of a great coastal defense we moved again across a narrow but swift moving stream that flowed down into the ocean then past beautifully kept fields until with a jerk we pulled up at my little station it was almost as if the engineer resented having to stop at so small a town and jolted us to indicate his disapproval i piled out with my two bags and my briefcase onto the platform and saw that the station was deserted i watched the train pull away i was stranded stupidly i had forgotten to wire the time of my arrival then i looked up from the far side of the tracks a railroad tramp was walking his slouchy way he headed directly for me dirty from the road unshaven and unkempt but when he spoke his voice was that of an educated man and his language was clipped exact english sorry he said but if you could lend me a cigarette i smiled at his choice of verb he took the cigarette out of the pack almost daintily he nodded in appreciation as i held up my lighter the flame gave me an almost photographic image of his face then as he turned away and sat down on the station platform i forgot all about him the station yielded up automatic lockers i threw my two bags safely inside one of them turned the key and with my briefcase under my arm took the only road that led away from the station and of a consequence must i thought move toward the anchorage my query at the little village gas station confirmed my direction and i swung down past the general store the post office the three churches one of them catholic and into the black surfaced road toward my destination it was a lovely late autumn afternoon with the trees turning gypsy around me and the sun stroking my face and uncovered head as would a gentle old mother a turn in the road brought me within sight of the vast old pile that was the erkenwold mansion over the slight rise of land beyond i could hear the faint beat of the ocean upon a rocky shore as i swung along the last mile of my journey night came down with the swift thud of mid-autumn wide ancient gates open and apparently never used a winding road twisting up through magnificent elm trees toward the house and to my right what seemed to be a little porter's lodge the estate had no walls instead it seemed to be hemmed in with high untrimmed hedges that created a thick interwoven density there was a light on the first floor of the porter's lodge but since the lights in the main building so clearly beckoned me i decided to waste no time in useless questions the gravel of the drive crunched under my feet as i swung into the gateway and up the drive a voice brought me around with a quick whirl that almost threw me off my balance yet all the voice said was well 
the door of the porter's lodge was now open a deep shadow was thrown about it by the faintness of the light in the room beyond the door jamb served as a frame for the grotesque figure silhouetted between the deepening gloom of the outdoors and the pale light of the house's interior perhaps because the man was in silhouette the grotesqueness of his figure stood out in repellent relief i had the feelings that here was a head on which the hair had been tousled by the ages hair defiant of any comb that might attack it matted unparted with locks astray in all directions the head itself on which in the gloom i could hardly distinguish a face was set deep in hunched shoulders he turned slightly and i saw that tall as he seemed in the darkness the man was a hunchback involuntarily i took a step forward to speak to him in that instant i could feel his eyes sweep me from shoe to hair and back again what light came from the house hit me squarely his inventory of me seemed so thorough that i felt as if he had subjected me to a complete investigation some unimportant question or other was trying to frame itself on my lips some greeting that i could give to the sentinel who had popped out of his mysterious sentry box to halt me but before words took shape the man had backed away and the door slammed in my face with a rude dismissal that i know must have made me flush impulse almost made me batter with my fist at that unmannerly door second and wiser thought made me shrug my shoulders and hit down the gravelled road toward the light in the main house quite without volition i found myself turning to look back over my shoulder at the lodge in which a light now seemed to move from window to window i'll be seeing the scarlet archer myself i thought trying to laugh yet had the scarlet archer suddenly barred my path for the second i should not have been surprised tim's welcome made me forget the rank and hospitality of the lodge keeper hardly had the butler opened the door in answer to my ring when tim pushed him aside and caught my hand and slapped my shoulder affectionately no doubt about it the man was happy to see me it's nice to be made welcome sometimes however and this was one of those occasions extreme cordiality makes me nervous and suspicious where are your bags and why in the world didn't you wire me when you'd arrive was it a tiresome trip aren't you a great guy to come like this tim had a way of asking a dozen questions in a breath not really caring whether or not you paid any attention to the trivial ones if you picked out the ones you yourself wanted to answer in a jiffy he had given the butler orders about retrieving my bags he's not dad's butler tim apologized uncle henry brought him in we had adjoining rooms on the second floor the rooms had been allowed to keep all the mill the beauty of their original design paneled walls great deep beds window seats of carved wood and ceilings that would have given an antique collector severe temptations against the tenth commandment but tim's father had modernized the rooms to the extent of fitting indirect lighting into the pattern of the original design and installing a bath that made one rejoice for the twentieth century tim talked inanities or rather the pleasant nothings which served to cover nervousness and bridge the time lapse between the meetings of friends i told him what little had developed in the lab since his brief leave had begun all the while it was clear that he was merely skittishing around the edges of the main subject on his mind the subject that had made him send for me and had made me though i could not so much as guess its meaning detour from a planned vacation when i saw that he was waiting for his cue i gave it amusing passage in that book i said squatting in the deep window seat as i talked about that scarlet archer you know what's the matter tim hasn't he heard that ghosts went out with modern plumbing when your dad installed that i waved at the modern improvements he gave all the family ghosts their quietus tim sat down opposite me leaning against the deep embrasure into which the leaded window had been sunk and lit a cigarette you talk a lot about ghosts he said quietly but of course you don't really believe in them why not i demanded i've always said that i wished i had seen a ghost yes i remember the day you said that you wish you had seen one maybe my lad you're going to see one right here i laughed in embarrassment it's hard for a student of physics to be too serious when his best friend promises to let him have a ringside seat at the walking of a ghost tim let an astral cloud of smoke fill the embrasure what puzzles me he said quietly is why i decided to spend my leave here at all perhaps i just wanted to tell myself i could do it 
I was so cut up when Dad gave the place to his brother. I love the place. In that will, Dad didn't say I must stay away from the place. Perhaps I wanted to see what Uncle had done to it. Much? I interrupted. Enough, he answered. He stood up and said it I. Anyhow, here I am, and so apparently is the archer. I wonder if the error is meant for me this time. He must have seen the puzzled look on my face. The legend, Luke, the archer appears, and Urkenwold dies. Am I to be the one? His grip on my shoulders was meant to be reassuring. His answering laugh had no ring in it. Come, he commanded. Dinner won't be for a bit. Let me show you something interesting or queer. He swung out of the room, down the broad, beautifully carved stairs, into the big drawing room, and then through heavy velvet curtains and into the dim dining hall. Hall was really the word. No one could remotely call that magnificent apartment a mere room. He switched on a wall bracket light that threw soft yellow beams down the rich old age stained panels. I saw him stroke with his fingers a spot in the wall. Then as I leaned forward I realized that it was not a spot. It was a clean cut in the wood, made as if someone had expertly driven a knife blade, but not too deeply into the timber. Tim did not withdraw his hand as he talked quietly. We were sitting at table the evening before last. Dinner was practically over. Uncle sits here. He indicated the head of the table. I sit here. He touched the chair to his uncle's right, and I saw that it was embarrassingly close to the gash in the wall. Suddenly I looked up and almost screamed. Why I didn't say a word, I don't know. But I sat there silently. This time I saw that he was pointing. Across from where we stood were magnificently arched glass doors, or double windows, which reached from floor to ceiling. Even now they were swung wide open, so that the arch framed the dark garden beyond. But it was easy to see out, for the sky seemed a sort of grey-green backdrop against which I was sure the movement of people could be clearly visible. Tim let me take in the stage setting before he continued. Along that slight rise of land, which is the highest point between us and the sea, I suddenly saw, laugh if you want to, but it is the plain fact, a medieval archer quietly so as not to frighten the ladies it was the first time he referred to any ladies i touched my uncle's hand and nodded toward the figure from the look on his face i knew that he saw the archer too the figure the ghost whatever it was lifted a bow there was a faint twang of a bowstring and an arrow buried itself here again he touched the wound in the wall perhaps you've never had your best friend tell you he was shot at by a ghost I had never been told that before. I don't want to be told it again. I tried to laugh, but it was a poor retort. Tim walked behind his uncle's place and came to the enormous buffet that filled the wall. Quietly he picked up something and held it out to me. I looked down at the thing. I had mechanically accepted. It was an ancient arrow, straight and tipped with metal, and the shaft was painted a bright red. A message from the scarlet archer of Agincourt, said Tim quietly. And, for a moment, I am frank enough to confess, I was frightened, too. End of chapter 1 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 2 of Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord S.J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 2 I stood with the arrow in my hand. There must certainly be something I could say. Yet what could a person possibly put into words when his best friend has handed him an arrow that a ghost or a marauder or a medieval archer, risen from a dusty tomb, has shot into a nearby wall? When a bell suddenly sounded, deep and resonant, and quite in keeping with the character of the house, I know I jumped. Tim laughed, took the arrow, and threw it back onto the buffet. He explained the bell. Warning bell for dinner. Used to mean in England the signal for everyone to dress. If your bags are here, you can at least wash up a bit. The butler had opened my retrieved bags, so with that unaccustomed service of luxury, a bath and a change seemed called for. Tim left the door between our rooms open when he went into change. We continued to talk, disjointed, pleasant, friendly chatter, with no particular point or purpose, 
other than the reassurance of the sound of his voice and what I hope was my pleasant response. We were ready in ten minutes and again ensconced in the window seat. We had turned off the lights in our rooms, but now soft lights flooded the terrace outside the house. I noticed that our rooms faced away from the main road, as did the dining hall, and toward the rise of land where the archer had appeared, and then on toward the sea, which lay out of sight. I took in the fact that the hill was crowned with a little summer house, pseudo-Greek in character, but charming in black outline against the deep blue of the evening sky. Suddenly onto the light-flooded terrace walked a woman. Madame Leclerc, Tim said in quiet explanation. The wedding seems to be definitely fixed for next month. He laughed ironically. I knew that his laugh was dismissal of any chance that he would be heir to the Arkham old estate. The woman on the terrace was parading, I might also say, dramatically. She was clearly tall and not too large for classic beauty, but she had an air and a distinction of manner that appeared in the way she walked and the artful way she handed an obsolescent fan. At length she sat down in a deep garden chair, her long evening dress dropping in cloudy folds about her. She fell naturally into a stage picture. Whatever the beauty or lack of beauty in her face, she knew how to move, with the steady grace of one who has made an entrance in order to charm her audience. Then as we sat, the only spectators of this graceful little scene, I suddenly sensed that Tim grew tense. Another woman walked out onto the terrace, but this woman's step was young and eager, and her dress was clearly youthful. She handed the woman in the garden chair a handkerchief and something which was answered by a languid wave of the older woman's hand, and then disappeared once more into the house. Tim seemed to sink back relaxed when she left the scene. And she, I asked quietly, Madame Leclerc's secretary, Beth Henley. I wanted to ask more questions, but something in Tim's manner put a complete period after that subject. He got up and walked across the dark room to his desk, opened it quietly, and came back with two sheets of paper. Neither is the original, he explained, both transcripts. Back of him there was a small wall bracket light, which he flicked on. Before he began to read, he explained briefly, This is from my uncle's first letter to Dad, after his partial recovery from that hunting accident. The original letter was destroyed. I kept this excerpt. I am lying in the hospital in Carlsbad. Bad as are my pains, horrible as it is to know that I shall never walk again. My greatest pain is that there is nothing I can say to you who have lost your son. Had it not been for his heroism, I should probably be the one lying dead back there in the jungle, and he might be in my place, sitting in a German hospital, and knowing what it means to be a helpless invalid. For all that, James, I feel utterly guilty. I invited Chris on that hunt. I made all the arrangements for the trip. My carelessness exposed him to that charging rhino. He died to save me. And the cavalry that is mine, well, even that cannot bring your son in a resurrection that would give you joy. Forgive me, James. I cannot face you until the memory of his death, for my sake, has grown a little more dim. Rhetoric, I couldn't help saying, too emotional for a man of his age. I, too, felt it was insincere, Tim agreed. That's why I kept it and read it to you now. I hated to open the wound, for I knew how hurt he was, yet somehow I sensed a connection that I could not understand or explain. But your uncle did come back. He did take over. Sad as he pretends to be, or to have been, over your brother's death, he still doesn't mind being the heir. My voice died off, as a voice will when the speaker knows he is saying more than he means to say, or that he can't find the right words for some unpleasant, difficult truth. He came back right enough, wheeled in by that horrible hunchback valet of his. I'm sure that I raised myself perceptibly from my seat. So that's who he is. Tim looked at me in surprise. The chap in the porter's lodge? I queried. He opened the door as I passed by. I felt like asking, Charles Lawton or Boris Karloff? But Glott and Karloff are that way only on the stage, said Tim. Well, my uncle is wheeled in, and I had no idea of what was going on. He takes over completely. Dad was ailing during that last year, but he insisted on my going on with my work. Had I been here instead... He stood up and crushed a cigarette in an ashtray. Let's go down, he said. The lights all the way down the beautiful old staircase had been turned on. When we reached the first landing, we stopped. There Tim opened a door in the wall and flicked on a light. We stepped into a small room, the far end of which was apparently a large stained-glass window. 
Because of the darkness outside, I could not make out the figures in the glass, only the meaningless wanderings of the leaded mullions. Around the room were small card tables and deep, comfortable chairs, which for some reason looked surprisingly new. On the walls were sporting prints, clearly a card room, beautifully furnished and yet apparently not used. Nice little card room, I said. He shook his head. No, it's a chapel. I know my face must have mirrored my amazement. I could only look at the card tables, the sporting prints, the leather chairs, the smoking stands, to realize Tim must be joking. And yet that stained glass window. Rather, it was a chapel, he amended. To my surprise, he blessed himself and knelt briefly as in prayer. I did the same thing, though my bewilderment interfered considerably with any prayers I might have thought up on the spur of the moment. When he stood up, he began to talk quietly. I always make a little act of reparation, he explained. I told you that my uncle had made hardly any changes in the place. Well, this is the hardly. You see, the Archimolds that came from England couldn't forget the little secret chapel in which the priest had said mass for the hunted Catholics. That was the dearest place in their home, the source of their strength and persecution. So when, even in this land of religious freedom, they came to build here on the general plan of the place they had left in England, they included the little chapel. They put it here near the staircase so that any of the Archimolds coming up or going down the stairs could drop in for a visit to the Lord. My father had the bishops leave to have Mass said in our chapel three times a year, and we all loved those big days. It seemed incredible that with their family record of Catholicity, one of them should. Yes, Tim continued, Uncle Henry had it ripped out. I'm sure that to the end Dad didn't know that Uncle had fallen away. I never guessed it. That wheelchair was his excuse for his not going to Mass. But the moment he took over the place, the chapel went. His disguise was over. You've no idea how he hates the church. I've met ex-Catholics in my day. If they all have one note in common, it is the embarrassed, guilty hatred they feel toward the religion they have deserted and betrayed. We walked through the main drawing room and out onto the terrace, where Madame Leclerc welcomed us. She turned on Tim a practiced smile, which, thanks to the light and her masterful makeup, for just a moment made her tired, wrinkled, past middle-aged face seem beautiful. Her voice had a faint, noncommittal accent. She offered her hand as if she expected it to be kissed. Expectations, as far as Tim and I were concerned, were not fulfilled. Then Beth Henley came in, and between Tim and the girl there swept a current that was like the sudden turning on of the electricity in two powerful poles, and with the best of reasons. She was about twenty-two years old, charming, gracious, not quite blonde, not quite red-haired, content to be as God had made her, slim and vigorous. Her preferred hand was gentle and strong at the same time. She called me Captain just once, and then at the unspoken plea in my eyes she called me Luke, as she called my Lieutenant Tim. "'Did you?' asked Madame Leclerc, in a correctly modulated voice. "'Hear of the simply distressing practical joke that was played on us? Or do you think it was perhaps a stray arrow from some carelessly managed archery range? But where in the world would one find an archery range around here?' Do people play at silly games like bows and arrows any more? I thought only Cupid. Dear me, how dreadfully afraid I have always been of Cupid, the naughty fellow. But in the midst of dinner, an arrow in one's wall. Ah, many a time in the course of a dinner, an arrow aimed at one's heart, or better still at the heart of one's partner. She was the kind of woman who was what you might call a chain talker. Each word seemed to suggest another word. She lighted each succeeding sentence from the faint spark of the sentence that was dying. I knew this could go on indefinitely, so I settled back to chain smoke cigarettes, willing to act as interference for Tim, who was plainly eager for a few quiet words with Beth. Ah, for the selfishness of young love, and ah, for the men like myself, who suffer ancient bores, that young love may have its chance. Again the mellow old bell rang. I had a quick glimpse of the butlers pulling the cord that vibrated the ancient morning. I gave Madame Leclerc my arm, and Tim tossed me a grateful look as he tucked Beth's fingers into the protecting crook of his hand. We walked into the dining hall, now bright with the candles, that were set on the table and on the buffet and took our places. This time it was I who was to sit facing the arch that framed a sector of the garden and the softly lighted terrace. Even as I looked, the butler switched out the terrace lights and plunged the garden into sudden gloom. Madame Leclerc stood at my right next to the vacant place at the table's head. 
Tim and Beth Henley were across from me. Then, for the first time, I noticed that there was no chair at the uncle's place. And though we had talked of him so much, and I had thought of him so often, I realized with a start that I had never seen him. There we were standing, accorded attention, while the master of the house deliberately kept us waiting. No one made a move to sit down. Even the women waited patiently. We just stood at attention, kept there by the unseen host who demanded this as his due. The butler moved to the door near the buffet, and back of the uncle's place. So, I thought, that is the corridor to his apartments. The door swung open, and an impatient voice growled, Look out for my foot, you fool. If you bump it, I'll kill you. And into the dining hall came the processional. Processional is a large word to describe the entrance of two people, yet no lesser word will do. The wheelchair was no ordinary clumsy, heavy affair. It was evidently a special job, as finely done as a high-priced car. It moved without sound, almost without pressure, and it could be handled either by an attendant or by the occupant himself. The occupant immediately gripped my attention. He sat erect and stiff in the chair. He seemed to move his head hardly at all, as if he did everything, with his eyes, which kept moving at an almost terrifying rate of speed. He was not old, hardly farther along than his mid-fifties, his jaw undershot in a look of perpetual defiance. My upsweeping glance reached the attendant. Though this was exactly what I had expected, I was none the less startled when I saw on back of the chair the man, fit attendant for a proper master, who had been my reception committee at the porter's lodge. Deftly he wheeled the chair to the head of the table. "'Go get your dinner,' the uncle tossed at him, over his shoulder, and without a glance at any of us the attendant was gone. Since he acted as the uncle's valet, I will henceforth, for convenience sake, refer to him simply as the valet." I deliberately honor his unique unpleasantness with a capital V. Uncle, said Tim, this is my friend Captain Luke Foster. I've heard of you, replied the uncle. From the tone of his remark I might have suspected that he'd been told I was a murderer, a dope peddler, a baby snatcher, or first cousin to a rattler. That was all the welcome I got. Then to the assembled foursome. Well, sit down, sit down. His voice rasped and heckled, and grated like a file over chinaware. You'd think the lot of you were waiting for Grace. Don't waste your time. Grace used to be said in this house, when tribute was still being paid to Rome. Those days are gone. It wasn't that I wanted to be heroic, or that I chose to insult my host. But something inside me made me deliberately cut him short. I blessed myself, quietly said my own Grace, blessed myself again, and looked up. His eyes were blazing and to my pleasure I saw that my gestures had been duplicated by Beth and Tim. "'Another Catholic?' demanded the uncle. "'How a scientist, as I hear you are, can believe in medieval superstition?' "'Perhaps,' I answered, suddenly realizing that politeness would be wasted upon this fellow. "'I believe because I am a scientist.' "'Sit down, all of you,' he ordered, and we sat. Not many months before I had seen Maurice Evans in Hamlet, that perverse sense of humor which saves us when we might otherwise let anger swell into murderous passion may be one to call this old growler Uncle Claudius. Intuition is sometimes much too accurate. Whether she was trying to ease a difficult situation, or merely giving her naturally garrulous nature free play, or hogging the center of the stage, Madame Leclerc took over, began to talk, and wafted us through the soup and fish, and up to the roast on a river of conversation that left us free to float along to eat quietly and hide away in the thickets of our own thoughts. Then that perversity which makes a man excite trouble when he should be wanting to avoid it made me look across the table at Tim. Would there be any problem about my getting into the village in the morning, Tim? I asked. Not a bit, he replied. There are three cars in the garage. Fine, I said. I thought I'd go in for the first Friday. The uncle looked up from his roast and did a little silent target practice of his own on me. Said Beth quickly. Might I go with you and Tim? She added. Let's all go, concluded Tim superfluously. But I was not through baiting the bear at the head of the table. Too bad, I said, that you haven't a chapel here, on so beautiful an estate. We had a chapel, shot back the uncle. Really? I asked, all innocent interest. I saw Tim's eyebrow raised in surprise. Was I being deliberately or forgetfully stupid? Yes, the uncle retorted. But I've put it to useful purpose at long last. It's a card room now, a place where a man can go and relax, meet his friends, act natural, be gay. 
That's what I do in a chapel, I replied, my innocence growing in leaping bounds. I relax, meet my friends, act supernatural, and really am very happy. The uncle laid down his knife and fork and bent upon me a look which I suspected he had tried on many a subordinate, with mighty effect. It merely made me want to laugh. I tolerate the faith or lack of faith of any of my guests, Captain. I do not wish religious propaganda to be broadcast at my table. Why, Mr. Erkenwold? My eyes were wide with guilelessness. I thought that the religious tradition of the Erkenwolds was as old as the history of England. Then let it die with me, he said with quiet venom. I shot my own arrow into the dark, being careful not to see where it would land. Tim, I said, and put laughter and guileless mirth into my voice. As officers in the United States Army, we have to keep an eye on your uncle. You know, when a man gives up his loyalty to his religion, I always wonder how much loyalty he still has for his country. Loyalty is such a fundamental thing. The uncle looked positively purple. He could not stem his rage. Damn nonsense, he cried. I'm a better American than you can ever help to be. I love my country without splitting my allegiance with some other in foreign power. God bless America. I'll say that even if a Jew did say it first. Who could miss the contempt he put into the word Jew? I'm a patriot, a better patriot than ever since I ceased to be a Roman and became entirely, absolutely American. Again, Hamlet occurred to me, but it was not the uncle in Hamlet. It was the mother who did protest too much. Like the guardian of the water wheel, I stepped aside and let the even splashing, cool, innocuous stream of Madame Leclerc's deluded monologue again carry us peacefully nowhere. But the uncle was far from through with me. Or was it some secret worry, some guilt in his own soul, some recurring voice of conscience that would not be drowned, that goaded him to hound the subject? He pointed his knife at me with a gesture that seemed to screw me. I hear you and this nephew of mine are working on a new type of magnetized bullet. I nodded. I'm interested in all things scientific, he continued. That's the field in which lies the future of the world. Not religion, not superstition. If you're using religion and superstition as synonyms, I gently corrected, may I present you with a thesaurus for Christmas? I don't know what dictionaries say about those two. I talk from experience. Did you? He switched back to the bullet. Bring your plans and drawings with you? Well, in a way, yes, and in a way, no. What's that nonsense mean? He demanded. Tim and I, and perhaps an expert, could read them and understand them, but the layman... An expert could? He demanded too eagerly. Then he restrained himself. I'm no expert, but if you would be willing to show an old patriot the thing that is being developed to save our beloved country... I'm proud of Tim, you know. That was such a lame ending. It was amusing to note another old custom that had been retained. After dessert, the ladies left the table, and us men. I learned later that Beth had gone to her room. We three men sat silent, smoking. There were brandy and liquor, but Tim and I didn't take either. The uncle drank alone, and too much. Tim had moved to my side of the table, and together we looked out into the bright autumn night. The sky was a deliciously cold blue-green. The line of the rising lawn was clean-cut against the horizon, and the stately columns of the summer-house stood starkly outlined in the light. Inevitably, I thought of a scarlet archer. Inevitably, there rose again a perverse desire to badger the old boy. Interesting legend, isn't it? That story of the scarlet archer, I began. I had badgered him right enough. In fact, he was fairly spluttering. Nonsense! The most horrible, superstitious nonsense! Right out of the heart of those benighted Catholic times. Imagine the rot. A scarlet archer rising out of his grave. And if he did rise out of his grave, what has that to do with his death, and anybody's death? He continued to splutter, but when a person rants too long, those with an earshot cease to listen. I was merely chuckling inside myself, paying no attention to anything that he said. Chuckling, that is, until all of a sudden, all thought of laughter died in my throat. I had been looking absently at the summer house, thinking of nothing in particular. Suddenly it seemed to me that one of the columns started to move. Only it wasn't a column. It was the figure of a man, clear and bold against the blue-gray of the autumn sky. He stepped from the vicinity of the summer house and walked along the brow of the rise of land. I know that drops of sweat appeared suddenly on my forehead. I know I fumbled in my throat before I found my voice. When I did speak, the words were not voiced in terror, but in irony. 
It seemed almost as if the figure on the hill had come in answer to the challenge of the angry man at the head of the table. "'You may be entirely right,' I said quietly, though my throat was dry, and it took some wrenching to make my words clear and distinct. "'But the ghost or masquerader, the figure on the horizon there, deserts at least your curious interest.' He swung his head almost violently toward the figure that was distantly framed in the arch of the doorway. For a moment I thought his rigid hands, which were clutching the arms of his chair, were going to force him upright. Then it was almost as if he collapsed, but his eyes never left the striding figure on the rise. Tim, who had been playing lazily with the cigarette between his fingers, looked up. It was he who said in a hushed yet awestruck voice, "'The archer!' It was the archer right enough. There was no mistaking the outline of those medieval clothes, the strong, trim legs and hose and high boots, the leathern jerkin, and in his hand the unmistakable line of the bent bow. He reached a spot that could not have been more than ten yards from the summer-house. It was precisely the spot at which the lawn rose to a little friendly hillock that was almost exactly on a level with the dining-hall, which was raised, of course, by the height of the terrace on which the house had been built. Then, with a graceful swing, the figure wheeled toward us. His motions were skilled, exact, and even at a distance ghost-like, and vague as he lifted his bow, plucked an arrow from the quiver on his back, aimed for just the briefest second, and let go. There was the musical twang of the bowstring. I heard the uncle scream just once, and then the swish of the arrow cut between Tim and myself, and was impacted quivering in the wall beyond us. "'You fools! You fools!' It was the voice of Tim's uncle, and we were clearly the ones he meant. After him! Get him, ghost or no ghost! Get him, I say! Oh, if I were only young enough, strong enough! Whatever the power of his voice, it served as sufficient impulse to set the two of us racing around the table. We reached the arched door simultaneously, and together plunged out onto the lawn. I had not realized how far away that rising mound was, but as we cleared the terrace, the archer, almost as if he were waving to us, swung his bow into the air. Our drive toward him curved us slightly to the left. The clump of trees back of the summer-house swung, under the influence of our movement, directly behind the columns, blocking them out. In long, clean, athletic strides, the archer leaped up the slope and dived into the blackness created by the mingled shadows of summer-house and trees. We reached the rise of ground, swung across it toward the summer-house, and then stopped, feeling frightened, embarrassed, and a little foolish. There was not the slightest sign of an archer ghost or man, anywhere, nor was there the slightest trace of the passing of any mortal visitant. "'Do you believe in ghosts?' I asked, trying to be jocose. Tim was grimly serious. "'Not I,' he answered. "'No, not I, but—' And he voiced what had already been more than a suspicion in my mind. "'Do you know, I believe that my doubting uncle isn't so sure that ghosts can't come back.' "'As prelude to death,' I concluded— we walked back slowly to cross the lawn, feeling like schoolboys who, not having done their exercises, were about to face a stern teacher. Tim's uncle sat hunched up in his chair, but his eyes were blazing. "'You didn't get him,' he hurled at us accusingly. "'Wherever he went,' Tim began. "'And you call yourself soldiers,' he taunted. "'Officers. I know lands in which no ghosts walk. I know police and soldiers who are trained to handle intruders. I know—' He stopped abruptly. Then, with a speed I had not thought possible, he navigated the wheelchair across the room and pulled the arrow out of the panel wall, leaving behind a gaping wound in the wood. He flung the arrow straight at Tim. "'It's for you,' he meant it. He shouted furiously. "'That arrow is not for me. Whether it was meant as warning of death or as death itself, it is yours, not mine. Yours, not mine.' The perverse desire to badger him welled up again. "'Mr. Erkenwold,' I said, for a man who has given up all faith in the supernatural, aren't you being horribly bothered by the ghost of a scarlet archer? End of chapter 2 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 3 of Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 3 In answer to the shouts of Tim's uncle, the valet appeared in the doorway. He was wiping food off his mouth with the back of his hairy hand. I liked him for nothing, absolutely nothing, 
but most of all i disliked him then for the cool insolence with which he swung the uncle's wheelchair around as if he were slapping us all in the face and pushed the still angrily vibrating old gentleman out of the dining room and back towards his apartments when we entered the long graciously appointed living room the first stray whiffs of the equinoctial storm were plucking at the heavy draperies beth was sitting at the piano playing softly madame leclerc was posed against the casement her soft dress moulded by the breezes her head back as if at any moment she would begin an aria and such music as the metropolitan had not heard since sembridge would issue from within her throat let's skip the next hour above the flow of the ex prima donna's chatter i was listening to the rise of the storm where else in the world do god's majesty and power in nature ever seem as striking as it does near the sea when the wind rises and you hear the distant pound of the surf and safe on the solid land you can admire without being afraid the odd without being cowed it must have been fully an hour though before madame leclerc finally bade us good night and slept off to her room i had the feeling that madame leclerc would sleep as gracefully and dramatically into a powder room to brush her teeth well finally breathed tim in that alone at last tone that made me feel worse than unnecessary i rose with studied nonchalance i have a little work to do i explained elaborately and if you two young people don't give us that you young people stuff laughed tim and beth laughed too anyhow we'd be afraid to be alone up under the roof tim had caught my inquiry and answered it beth and i have found the most wonderful spot from which to see the ocean come along we always take my portable radio up with us and from that deep comfortable window seat so that was how i found myself with my face pressed close to the window up under the eaves the rain beating fiercely against the heavy leaded glass the wind laying fierce clutching hands on the strong old house and blue-gray flashes of lightning filled the world with wonder and horror tim and beth sat close together and i didn't need to pry to be sure they were holding hands we talked very little the spell of the storm was upon us all we felt i think all the majesty of a storm at sea and we were at the same time deeply grateful that our ship was a house and that it was anchored firmly on solid rock foundations the radio was playing softly with occasional protests of static when the lightning flashed it was some symphonic recordings i remember a feeling of drowsiness began to come over me very soothing and pleasant in the midst of that fierce equinoctial outburst and then i was jolted into full wakefulness you know how at the end of a lightning storm though the thunder seems far away and the danger pleasantly remote there will often be two or three particularly bright flashes such a flash bright and swiftly repeated floodlighted the scene before me and i had the quick impression that against the horizon and over the rise of the lawn and the sea wall there were the unmistakable lines of a ship look i cried to the two a ship or am i crazy they peered out into the darkness there was a second flash this time quite faint and remote and yet in the split second of illumination we were all sure that we saw a ship close in shore much too close in shore for anything but peril tim's fingers twisted the radio dial from long to short wave we seemed to be reasoning simultaneously perhaps we thought it was a ship being dashed against the rocks and was even now calling for help out of the radio came a jumble of ship signals and calls the crying of terrible static but no sound of any ship in danger no real cry across the air for help then in sharp descrescendo the storm died down let's go to bed said sleepyhead beth had jumped up and looked at her wrist watch i had not realized that it was almost midnight reluctantly tim rose as for myself i was quite ready to sleep we flashed led our way down the stairs that led to the floor where the bedrooms were saw beth safely to her door waved her a wordless good night and were about to tiptoe our way back to our own rooms but even as she swung her door open i caught through her window a glimpse of the porter's lodge the valet was still up or else he kept a light on in his quarters while he slept i left him at his room and i padded on to mine up to that moment i had been more than ready for sleep now a sudden alertness pulled me to the window the rain had died down to a drizzle the lightning had faded to rare dim flashes far toward the east yet i stood in the deep recess of that bay window looking out across the lawn toward the sea then over the hill he came 
Strange how a wet raincoat will gleam in the darkness of the night. I saw him more than a hundred yards away. My eyes followed him as he crossed the lawn without hesitation or stumbling. He was walking like a man who knew his way around the grounds, even in the darkest night. He was heading straight for the house, no doubt of that. I leaned forward, wiping the damp mist from the inside of the glass. A faint flicker of lightning wakened, exasperatingly inadequate glimmers. What queer memory made me feel that I had somewhere, somehow, seen that figure before, and seen it at close range? Before I could answer my own query, the figure was lost in the deep shadow of the house. I was one living ear, craning for sound. Rewarded, I heard far off in the building the ringing of the ancient doorbell. I know that I leaped across the room, opened the connecting door between us, and called softly to Tim. He had already been half asleep, but in an instant he was up, and we stood, I at the window, he at my partially opened door. Nothing happened my way, but both of us heard the sound of the door below open, the whisper of voices, and then silence. I took a book from the guest bookshelf and thrust it between the door and the jam. Another book I placed in back of the door to hold it in place. Then each of us took turns as sentries at the window. Tim flung himself down on my bed and slept. After an hour I woke him, and he watched. Then I—I I had a rush of guilty consciousness. I knew that I had slept, for a misty dawn was climbing up out of the sea, drenched and foggy and gray, and Tim lay in his dressing gown on my bed, sleeping the sleep of the justly exhausted. If our visitor had left during the night, he had left without our seeing him. Beth met us in the big reception hall, had it and raincoated for our trek to town. Tim wheeled the small car out of the garage, using all precautions not to disturb the still-sleeping house, and with Beth jammed in between us, we hit off across the broad highway for the village and the first Friday Mass. How wise the church was when she picked the morning as the time for Holy Communion. One rises feeling so clean, washed with the sleep of the night. Around one the earth is on tiptoe to worship its God. And human speech comes slowly, almost reluctantly, even between the dearest of friends. One has time for God as the beautiful day rises over the beautiful world. One has a most pressing need for God. We knelt together at Mass in the little village church, we and a handful of villagers and people from the countryside. Instinctively, I stepped aside to let Tim and Beth kneel together at the altar rail. I liked them like that. I'm sure God did, too. When we left after Mass, the sun showed signs of winning its unequal conflict with the clouds. We stopped in at a little tea shop for coffee and fruit, and then hit off toward home. Let's take the old road along the seawall, said Tim. It's not really a man-made seawall, just the high cliffs that nature built to protect us against the sea's bombardment. It's rough and hard going, but after a storm, the sea is beautiful. Beth clearly loved the idea. I approved heartily, and the light car under the strong hands of Tim sped safely along the narrow, rutted road that overhung the sea. The waves were still pounding a bit. Right ruffles of lace were sewn on each approaching roller. One could feel in the solemn air the threat that the equinox had not run its course. So I think we were all startled when, as the road curved sharply, we saw just before us an absolutely peaceful cove, and in the cove a small diesel-powered launch quietly riding at anchor. What a perfect harbor that would be, I thought, swiftly, if the cliffs did not rise so sheerly above it. As it was, the two calm arms of rocky land enclosed the deep pool of water, and overlapped enough to keep the storms out, and yet to admit the passage of a good-sized ship under the handling of a good helmsman. Well, I'll be blowed, cried Tim, softly lured into nautical verbs by the side of the ship. Is it the one you thought you saw last night? Beth asked. I wasn't sure. There was clearly no sign of damage on this ship. Besides, I wondered if I could have seen it from that high window, or if, when I had seen it, it was dangerously making for the harbor, or if that had been another ship and this one had been there all the while. Tim breaks a stop just above the ship. He hallowed loudly but received no answer. Thoughtfully he slipped back into gear and wheeled not more than a thousand yards when he ground his brakes again this time not of his own volition, but under the frightening impulse of Beth's horrified gasp. Look, she cried in a breathless whisper, and pointed down the side of the cliff. A ledge of rock thrust itself far out over the sea, about halfway down the cliff. It was the only ledge I had noticed. 
In the dark, no one would have guessed its unexpected abutment. But there on the cliff's ledge, face upward, and arms outstretched in the clear picture of death, lay the rain-coated body of a man. I was out of the car in a single leap, and leaning far over the ledge. A rush of recognition thrust me back upon my heels. No doubt of it. I had seen him only once, but then, with the strong light of a flame against his face. It was the tramp who had begged a light from me as I had stepped from the train the preceding afternoon. Was it the same man who had come across the lawn in the storm to pay his midnight visit? Of that I could not be sure. I explained all this in sentences that must have sounded like telegraph code. Tim looked at him appraisingly. And now dead, dead as a smoked herring, he said quietly, and I think the three of us all said a little prayer. We rushed back to the house, driving the car recklessly. Then, as we tumbled into the reception hall, we came to an abrupt halt. The sound of voices came from the dining room, Tim's uncle and the voices of two strangers. We motioned to Beth to drop her coat in her own room, tossed our coats onto the long hall bench, and strode into the midst of a breakfast for three. Tim's uncle sat in his wheelchair at his usual place at the table. To the right and the left of him were two seamen in the uniform of some nondescript merchant marine, but their markings were those of captain and first mate. Without rising, they looked up at us, and then turned inquiringly to Tim's uncle. He greeted us with his customary lack of welcome, but handled the introductions under the compulsion of good manners. "'Captain Smith and Mr. Johnson, his first mate,' said Tim's uncle. And I remember thinking at the time that he might have fumbled a few seconds longer and hit on less obviously fictitious names. Captain Smith smiled in oily recognition, rose, and offered a fat hand. Mr. Erkenwold, he said, taking in the uncle with a gracious gesture, has proved a friend in need. The storm last night, it was terrible. What luck brought us into that heaven-provided cove, I do not know. You know the ways of the sea, Captain Foster? he asked casually. The ways of a plane in the air and of any army over the rocks, yes, I misquoted, but put me on sea and I'm a babe in a bathtub. Did a relieved look shoot between the captain and his mate? And was there under the polished English of the officer a slight blur of accent? Or was I finding overtones and hidden meanings in everything in that strange setting? Whatever the case, I know that without signal or sign between us, Tim and I sat down to a second breakfast without a mention of the dead man who lay upon the ledge of rock. We said nothing about that absolutely unscathed ship lying peacefully in a harbor that no luck in the world would ever locate on a night of storm. If they had piloted their ship to safety through those overlapping arms of harbor rock, they had known exactly where they were going and how to get there, even in an equinoctial storm. The captain talked on, supplying us with the explanation which he plainly thought was demanded by the situation. He was quite proud of his little ship, he said. He and his good friend cruised, where other men played golf or went on mountain trips. But the storm last night had been so unexpected. They had taken a bad battering. No doubt of that. It would take them. He looked at the mate for confirmation. Perhaps four days to get the engines running smoothly again. I crossed my fingers under the tablecloth. What fools sailors think of the land lumber, as if a ship with a broken engine could possibly be guided through so narrow an opening in a storm like that. Well, once they had refitted, they'd be on their way to pick up his wife and his mate's family in Boston, then off to Florida to get away from the chilly autumn months. I could almost feel him sigh in relief as he completed his cock and bull story. I even thought I saw the heavy eyelid of his mate flicker approval. And your good uncle, he continued addressing Tim, graciously gave the marooned sailors a spotted breakfast. I felt that he had dragged that spot of breakfast out of some English novel he had read. Of course we'll live on our ship, but we are most grateful. Tim guarded the phone in the lower hall against intruders while I phoned from my room. Without difficulty, I got the village central and the sheriff's office. The sheriff's voice sounded as if it was impeded by sleep and perhaps bacon and eggs, but he snapped to attention when I gave him a synopsis of the scene on the cliff. I'll meet you there immediately, he answered all alertness. For a village sheriff, he sounded remarkably on the job. As I swung from the phone to pick up my hat and coat, I saw my door slowly closing. It took one leap to cross the room and jerk the door open. The valet was walking silently down the hall. Were you listening at my door? I demanded, losing all sense of dignity and discretion. 
He turned to me a face that would have been blank if I had not felt that it held the corners of a sneer. "'I beg your pardon, sir?' His voice was curved in an insulting query. "'If I catch you,' I began, then figuratively slapped myself for this burst of temper. I stopped short. "'I am not an eavesdropper,' he said, icily polite. "'Not even when I think that eavesdropping might bring me interesting information about the guests in this house.' A turn of the corridor swallowed him up. If I disliked him as a person, I disliked that voice of his still more. Cold, controlled, yet flicking like a whip, obsequious, yet insulting. I wanted to yell after him to come back to get his head knocked off his humped shoulders. Instead, I metaphorically shook myself and shot down the stairs to find Tim and Beth waiting for me. Our cars met head-on on the road, overtopping the sea. Out of the official car stepped Sheriff Clem Westbrook, and following him, black bag of office in hand, Dr. Sweet. We shook hands all around, and then knelt down to peer over the cliff at the body on the ledge below. Even as I did, I noticed for the first time that the curve in the road hid the ship from us, and us from the ship. I didn't know why, but I felt infinitely relieved. Clem Westbrook was as genial a soul as ever wore a sheriff's badge, and Dr. Sweet was an old-fashioned horse and buggy doctor, whose duties as coroner didn't take up two weeks out of his year. They both regarded the dead man with objective interest. "'A tramp,' said the sheriff, repeating the title I had applied to the fellow who had approached me near the deserted railroad station. "'They go south this time of year, after summering up here along the sea coast. Probably headed that way, and got caught in the storm, and thrown off the cliff.' That might, I argued to myself, have been the case, for though the wind blew in off the sea at this point, the curve in the road might have put the wind at the dangerous side. Yet that raincoat was not the kind of thing tramps carry around as standard equipment. I commented on that to the sheriff. He laughed good-naturedly. The professions, first of the sea and now of the law, were enjoying themselves at the expense of my amateur standing. They have away, these bums, he said, by picking up needed articles like that. I'll bet some householder couldn't find his raincoat before he went to work this morning. He rose and dusted his knees. Well, we got to get him up here where we can look at him, unless— he cast a reluctant glance down the sheer cliff. We have to go down to visit him. Tim scanned off his own coat and pulled his driving gloves a little more securely onto his hands. Was I right in thinking that he shot at me a warning glance, a glance that seemed to say I was not to contradict him, no matter what he said? I have a tow chain in the back of my car, he said. If you men will hold it, I'll go down and fasten it around the poor fellow, and you can pull him up. That fell in exactly with their ideas. They were quite willing to let someone else do the dirty work of scrambling down the cliff and fitting the tow chain around the dead body. We leaned heavily away from the edge as Tim went down the cliff like an experienced mountain climber. We consulted together on how best to pull once the chain was fastened around the limp body. We looked down again and answered to Tim's hail, and let out slack while he, with true Catholic respect for the dead, reined the chain almost reverently under the dead man's arms. We obeyed his signal as he motioned to us to pull away. Slowly, so as not to jolt the body against the cliff, we pulled the victim upward. Then we dropped the chain again, and Tim swiftly clambered up to our level. Tim took off his soiled gloves and tossed them down into the sea. I saw them fall into the water and realized how really narrow that ledge was. If this man had fallen anywhere else along the long line of cliff, he would have dropped into the sea, and the fierce waters would have swept him far off perhaps never to be returned to land. Some accident had made him fall there where the ledge projected. But if he had not slipped, if he had been fallen or been thrown, then the one who had attacked him would never have thought that at that one small spot was a waiting ledge. He would have been sure that his victim had dropped into the sea and been swept far beyond the chance of the bodies of reappearing as an accusing corpus delecti. The cheerful little coroner had been leaning over the body. Now he rose and dusted his hands. This was a cursory examination carried to a high art. No doubt of that. A tramp, no question about it. Look at these rags of clothes, and see that gash in his head? Enough to kill an ox. Fell off the cliff and landed on his head with a blow that killed him quicker than a bolt of lightning. Just turn him over to the potter's field, Sheriff. No use doing more than making a routine report on this for the records. I'll have an ambulance pick up the body. It was all as matter-of-fact and casual as that. The coroner got into the sheriff's car and headed for the village. The sheriff sat himself down, pipe in hand, as cheerful watcher of the dead tramp. 
and the three of us got back into our car and turned toward Arrow Anchorage. Mentally directing myself to the cove, I had a quick recollection of the ship there, and for the first time I knew that the house took its name from that peaceful little anchorage, which now played hostess to a strangely intriguing visitor. We came within sight of the house. Again Tim braked to a stop, and Beth and I looked at him in wordless surprise. This time he squirmed in the crowded seat and shook loose the right side of his coat. He dived his hand down into his pocket. "'If you think I took that climb down the cliff for the fun of the thing, or just for after-breakfast exercise,' he said, "'you're crazy.' He looked embarrassed. "'I don't know what made me expect this, but I did, and it was there.' He held out his open palm, and again I heard Beth gasp, for he was holding out to us the barb of an arrow, and attached to it was a small broken section of a red shaft. "'Where?' I began, but Tim cut in. In his heart, he answered, while I was working the chain under his arms. I saw the protruding shaft. I pulled it out. The cold night and the exposure had almost sealed the wound. There was no blood, and unless they investigate more carefully, which they won't do on the body of a tramp, they'll not notice the wound or the slight blood stains on his dirty linens. Archer? whispered Beth, voicing my query as well as her own. Possibly, said Tim, but do ghost archers shoot real people? And why waste an urchin old arrow on a tramp? Or is this part of one of the arrows that has already been shot by the archer, an arrow that suddenly came to a new and deadly use? No diagram was needed to make that possibility clear. What more perfect weapon for a murderer's hand than an arrow? A swift, dagger-like blow, and the shaft broken off close to the wound. And if that broken shaft was still in the house? Tim settled down to drive like mad. We took a beating as the car jolted over the ruddy roads. We were at the main entrance in what seemed a flash, and even as we arrived we became aware of the need for nonchalance and caution. The sudden snorting of a party of bloodhounds searching the house for a broken arrow might, to say the least, be regarded as unusual. So again, without need of words, we literally sauntered into the house and promptly scattered. I walked into the dining room and took a drink from the thermos on the buffet. Near it I had tossed the second arrow that had stuck itself into the paneling. It was still lying there, untouched and intact. I found Tim warming himself at the quite extinct fire in the fireplace that filled the far wall of the reception hall. He was elaborately kicking the cold ash. He shrugged as I approached him, and we followed Beth into the drawing room. There, too, the big, slow-burning log that had lent warmth and color on the preceding evening was now a gray mass of cold ashes. But Beth was not near the hearth. She was standing in the far window, holding something with both hands before her, apparently trying, somewhat clumsily, to conceal something. We crossed the room in quick strides, crowding around as if to be privy to her secret. Her hands, as she swung around, clasped the brim of a dilapidated old hat. It was precisely the sort of hat tramp would wear. Under the pillow, she pointed to the deep lounge. It had fallen forward and not been noticed. On a common impulse, we all rushed to the hearth. Tim crouched on his heels, prodding the gray, flaky ashes for something that might be worth our discovery. Suddenly he swooped forward, dug his hands into the ashes, and came up holding a small piece of charred wood. No slightest question about it. It was the burned portion of the shaft of an arrow. Tim slipped it into his pocket as we all rose. See if the other arrow is in your room, or anywhere about, I ordered. Even as Tim walked hurriedly toward the door, the wheels of the uncle's chair turned into the drawing room, and we looked up at the picture framed in the doorway, a horrid caricature of humanity, the uncle wheeled by the repellent valet. Stop, the uncle ordered the valet, as soon as they were within the room. I know the three of us must have faced him with guilty looks on our faces. For a moment we felt like criminals standing in the presence of a judge. I'm having your things packed, he said to us. Then, excluding Beth with a wave of his hand, you two men, I mean. The house is crowded. I'm sending you to town for a real holiday, one I'll be happy to pay for. He saw Tim's quick gesture of refusal, and his eyes narrowed briefly, and then opened in the crooked simultation of avuncular generosity. On second thought, he said, Beth can go along too. The three of you can see the New York shows, dance at the best nightclubs, have a real spree. You've been working too hard, and I owe it to the brave young soldiers of our country. He could not quite keep the sneer out of his voice, 
to see that you get back to camp in the best of health. Tim's mouth was very tight. My thanks, uncle, but we are staying here. The role of generous uncle gave way to that of solicitous uncle. Then I may as well tell you my real reason. I'm worried for you, Tim, my lad. Oh, it's not that I myself believe in ghosts, but that silly stuff has me worried. Oh, he laughed in an affection of good-humored annoyance with himself. Call me superstitious, if you wish, but I should be much happier, feel much safer, if you were out of the archer's range. Tim sat down in an easy chair with a gesture of finality. You are most unexpectedly kind, he said, but I myself am too much interested in ghosts, and so is Luke, to leave. You don't think, do you, my dear uncle, that I'd leave you to the ghost I myself was afraid to face? The uncle's face lost all pretense of generosity or interest at worry. It curled in a blast of undisguised distaste. In back of his head, in a sound that made me a little sick, the valet laughed just once. End of Chapter 3 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 4 of Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord, S.J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 4 The three of us, Beth, Tim, and I, drove to town again that afternoon. Ostensibly, we went to buy some swimming togs for me. Really, we went to see if we could spot any of the crew of that strange, too trim, too capable little ship. We had a bit of tea in the shop, drank a soda in the Greeks, and stopped in for a bottle of carbonated water in the town's dignified little bar. No sign of sailors, and no indication, in cue with our deft queries, that any had been that way. Queer, I ruminated, that ship needs more than just a captain and a mate. And if I know seamen, get them this close to shore, and they'll be hitting for a drink the first minute they can escape the ship. We drove back along the sea wall road. As we approached the cove, a single seaman on the deck of the ship looked up interestedly. He was tinkering with something that had once been part of an engine. As we came close, he waved energetically at us, and held up as if in amusement the part of the engine he was working on. Only one seaman at work, I puzzled, and he up on deck, where any passerby is bound to see him. We ate alone, the five of us that night, half a dozen times, Tim's uncle brought the talk around to our plans for the magnetic bullet. He praised us profusely for remarkable pioneering. He hoped we'd let him see how far we'd progressed. Perhaps he might be inclined to put a little of his own money into our experiments. Tim winced visibly when his uncle referred to his recently and oddly inherited money as my own. Tim and I refused to nibble at such obvious bait. On the other hand, the uncle refused to be annoyed at the way that we changed the subject and shuffled the conversation for a fresh deal each time he edged near talk about the magnetic bullet. After dinner, he disappeared under the helmsmanship of the valet, and Madame Leclerc, who says she had slept little during the storm of the preceding evening, retired to her room. Beth and Tim danced to the music of a magnificent recording instrument, danced as if their hearts were in it. Can you tell by the ease and grace with which people dance that they are in love? I slipped away during the course of one of their waltzes and headed for my bedroom. The light switch was near the door, and I flicked it on automatically, and gave everything that swift, reassuring glance that is characteristic of most men in a strange room. I laughed a little at the nervous jitterness that made me think that someone had been in the room since I'd left it. Laughed, that is, until I happened to look toward the mirror which topped my dressing case. There, carefully folded and shoved into the mirror, was a scrap of white paper. I pulled it out and read it eagerly. The writing was in those childish characters always employed by people who are trying to disguise their handwriting. The wording was brief, but very compelling. Talk freely of your plans, but hide them under your tongue, and with your shrewdest ingenuity, the archer of Agincourt. I know the message sent me bounding across the room to the closet, into which I have flung my briefcase. I pulled out the case and opened it in swift survey. No matter how careless a man may be, he has an extra sense that lets him know when his personal things have been tampered with. I knew at once that the briefcase and the precious plans had not been touched. I was fingering the note and clinging to my briefcase when Tim rapped on my door. I tossed him the note, which he devoured in a glance. Friend or foe? Truth or a fake? I demanded. 
Tim sat on the edge of my bed, looking hard at the note. He shook his head in bewilderment. How can we tell? Well, I demanded savagely, who's interested in our plans? That's what I want to know. Besides your uncle, that is. And why is he trying to pump us? Tim flashed off the ceiling light, disappeared into his room, came back with drawing paper and other drawing equipment in his hand, swept everything off the small writing table, and over his shoulder barked at me, his superior officer, mind you. Get out those plans. I got them out with an unaccustomed docility. So, I said, in heavy-tongued irony, just to make it simpler for the thief, we'll have two sets of plans that they can select from. Watch, was all Tim answered. I watched, and as I did so, his plan dawned on me with belated clarity. He was copying all our specifications, our formulas, our equations, but he was making them all just sufficiently wrong to throw the person who might find them completely off the trail. It would be only after the model was worked out and tried that the hoax would be realized. Unless, that is, the thieves were experts in half a dozen branches of science. Bully boy, I said, patting him lightly on the shoulder. It was late when he was finally finished, and this time he switched out all the lights. Into my briefcase he inserted the carefully folded fake plans. Then he placed the briefcase in the top drawer of my dresser. He locked the drawer and handed the key to me. The house is full of duplicate keys he said. Then he unfastened the top of my talcum powder tin and balanced the tin against my clothes brush. A slight jolt such as the opening and closing of the drawer will cause the powder box to slip. Then even if it is placed upright again, we'll find a slight coating of talcum on the dresser. I nodded approval. Next he walked over and pulled the window shade down its full extent. Hold it until I tell you to let go, he said. Holding the true plans, he climbed up onto the window seat. Carefully, he laid the plans flat against the shade. Let go, slowly, he ordered. I released the shade gently, holding onto the cord. The tight spring pulled the curtain up, rolling as it moved, the plans tightly around the cylinder on which the shade wound. When the curtain was halfway up and level with the other shades, Tim called out, Enough, and clambered down again. Smart fellow, I approved. Though we slept soundly that night, it was not until I at least had prayed with the fervor and sincerity I had seldom evinced in the course of my life thus far. With a moderately early dawn, I was up, awakened by the sound of voices in the garden below. I meandered over to the window, and from the shadow of the heavy drapes watched the scene. But it was a scene that called for no secrecy. On the contrary, it was a little drama that I felt was produced for my entertainment and edification. The valet was wheeling Tim's uncle out on the lawn. Captain Smith and Mr. Johnson were talking loudly, as if they meant their voices, to cross the garden, or reach my room or Tim's. "'It will take us another three days,' the captain said. "'It's a bad break, but we'll good it right enough. You're most kind to be patient with us and have us in to breakfast. But in no time at all the engine will be right as rain, and we'll be on our way.' "'Right as rain. Another phrase learned from some novelist page,' I thought. Why did I have the certainty that this captain spoke in English that he handled too perfectly, with too bookish a precision? According to plan, we spent the morning on the badminton court. Tim and I. Madame Leclerc suddenly had need of her secretary's services, so Beth did not join us until lunchtime. Then, again according to plan, Tim and I played our new game. We talked quite freely of the magnetic bullet and the work we had done so far. Tim's uncle seemed delighted to be taken into our confidence. He praised us inordinately. He spoke with enthusiasm of the damage that this bullet would do to those dirty pirates who are attacking all the decencies of mankind. Even as we talked, I had the slow dawning sense that we had another listener. Each time the butler entered the dining room, I had the feeling that someone else was behind the swinging door that led to the kitchen and to the uncle's apartments. Finally, I said rather loudly, You see, Mr. Erkenwold, when we tell you these things, it is as to Tim's nearest relative. You can imagine how terrible might be the consequences if this information came to other ears. Of course, of course, the uncle agreed. Swiftly I leaped from my chair, and before anyone could speak, caught the swinging door and pulled it open. To other ears, I said furiously, like these. And in the doorway stood the valet. Only he did not stand. With all the calm self-possession in the world, he walked into the room, holding out towards Tim's uncle a packet of pills. Your medicine, sir, he said, and then to all of us, with cynical subservience, if I am not intruding. The uncle took the medicine without a word. 
It was the first time I had seen him take medicine at table, yet he obeyed as if he were hypnotized. Then, without another glance at us, the valet turned and walked out of the room. For all his appearance of guilt, I admitted to myself, I might have opened the door in timely coincidence for his walk from the uncle's apartment to the dining room. Yet I knew as well as I knew my own name that he had been standing and listening behind that door. After lunch, Tim, Beth, and I commandeered the small car. We rode toward the village again, and then drove past it, out toward the marvelous new airfield that was in the process of construction, and then back along the line of protecting works that hemmed in the coastal defenses from the highway. We returned to the village which was sufficiently near to a much larger city to be of small attraction to the men at work on the field or the fort. Still no trace of sailors in the village. Again we took the road toward the anchorage or cove. Again we saw the man, one man, at work on the deck. As we slowed down to wave at him, he again gestured energetically toward the engine on which he was working. The rest of the crew, he shouted, gesticulating, are down below in the engine room, working. We waved back at him and drove along the seawall road for perhaps a mile or two, until the road filtered out in a thin trail that ended in a promontory that thrust out over the sea. Tim stopped the car. We lit cigarettes and settled back. Well, asked Tim, I knew he wanted me to lay the pieces out for examination. I sorted them rapidly in my mind. They seemed to make no single picture, and yet— First of all, I said, let's confess that none of us trust your uncle. I repeat, a man who betrays his God and his faith. Well, faith and loyalty have a way of clinging together. If a man is disloyal one way, why not in another way? And his interest in our plans. That valet, said Bath, and I could feel her slight but unmistakable shudder. Where does the archer fit into this? Is he a ghost? Is he a man in masquerade? And that note from him to you? And his arrow in the heart of an unimportant tramp? Or was he an unimportant tramp? I was thinking aloud. And why all that information volunteered us by the man on the ship? Why try to account to us for all the crew that— I duplicated the gesture by which the man had indicated the hold, the engine room. The rest are below, working. If they were below, working, would he have needed to throw us off by telling us what is no concern of ours? Luke, said Tim, you're as muddled as I am, but I'm mighty glad Beth and I are not fighting this alone. I smiled at him for that conjunction of himself and Beth. It was sweet, even in the midst of murder and the threat of death. When we were back in my room, I headed straight for the dresser. Everything was exactly as we had left it. Almost. For there was a faint dusting of talcum on the dresser top, just the thin coat that would have floated from the open top of a box that had been jarred and had fallen. I unlocked the drawer and pulled out my briefcase. Whoever had handled it had done a remarkably careful job. Only the betraying powder on the top of the dresser indicated any tampering. I turned slowly to Tim. A chance line from the uncle's letter that Tim had read to me suddenly germinated in my mind. Where was your uncle during the days following his accident and Chris's death? Tim shrugged. Frankly, I wasn't interested enough to find out. But that letter he wrote was from a hospital in... in Germany. The warning bell sounded in the hall below, and we turned to our dressing with our minds churning. Captain Smith and Mr. Johnson were already standing at the dinner table when we arrived. They bowed ceremoniously to the ladies, and Madame Leclerc launched forth into a monologue that threatened to carry us straight through the meal. But whatever the state of his affections for her, Tim's uncle had no intention of letting her monopolize the conversation. Deliberately, almost rudely, he cut her short and tossed the query to Captain Smith. Whereupon, with polished wit and a real sense of narrative, the captain took over. He told us high tales of the sea. He had been with the United States destroyers during World War I. He paid Madame Leclerc compliments, tossed us politely worded questions, and brought high good humor and practiced charm to the dinner table. He even made a brief play for Beth, until he saw how firmly her attention was riveted to Tim. During the course of the dinner, the second of the equinoctial storms began first to toy with the draperies, then to lash in fury at the lights, then oblige the butler and the valet to close the windows then howl down the chimneys and scatter the sparks on the hearth. Finally it drove us into a little human cluster before the big living-room fire. The valet had on orders even pushed Tim's uncle in with the rest of us, almost as if he were afraid to be alone in that storm that battered raindrops like shrapnel against our windows and blasted at us with explosions of wind and lightning. 
we soon realized that it was taken for granted that the two officers would not even attempt to return to their boat that night. They gallantly protested the inconvenience their staying would cause. They bowed to the prospect of listening to Madame Leclerc sing arias from La Bohème and La Traviata. They even danced with Beth while old Orgenwald looked on in fake benignity, and young Orgenwald looked ready to murder and commit other deeds of swollen jealousy. Still by eleven o'clock we were in our rooms, and by twelve we had set in motion my crack brain plan. We were going down, storm or no storm, rain or no rain, to have a look at that ship. If there was just one man aboard, as we strongly suspected, he would be easy enough to handle. If there was a crew aboard, we might be in for trouble, and plenty of it. If there was no crew aboard, then where were they, and what were they doing? Raincoats were little enough use against that rapid fire of rain. Anyway, we wore the most absurd of outfits, swimming trunks, mufflers around our throats, heavy shoes over woolen socks, raincoats, and storm helmets. We carried electric torches and two small wrenches we had taken from the car's tool chest. Thus apparelled and armed, we set off into the downpour, wondering whether we were heroes or fools. In my deepest heart, I suspected that we would be proved the latter. For a pair who were supposed to be deeply concerned with a spectral archer, we had certainly found ourselves on another chase entirely. It was a long jump from Egancourt to that slick little diesel-motored ship in the anchorage. Remembering how plainly the midnight visitor had shadowed us as he cut across the lawn, I led Tim through the shadow thrown by the heavy hedges, passing from clumps of trees to the deeper shadow of solid boxwood. I confess that as we came close to the summer-house, I had a little start of expectant fear. Would the archer suddenly appear? Was its arrow meant for Tim? We found the road heavy with mud and deeply rutted, but we ploughed along, and the pounding sea to our left, and the blackness of arrow anchorage to our right. The water cut mercilessly through the openings in our coat, and drenched our already wet skins. Our boots became heavy with mud and muck, and we stumbled and fell against each other as we plodded our heavy way. Then Tim touched my arm, and together we leaned over the cliff. The wind seemed suddenly to pick up his coat and billow it out like a half-balloon. Tim careened back against me, gripping my arm. Down there, he indicated, is the cove. Let's wait for a flash of lightning. We had to wait only briefly. A sudden blinding flash showed us the amazingly calm waters of the cove, and riding the waters with hardly a swing or sway, the trim little ship was held safely by its anchor ropes. There's a way down, Tim said. We used to make it when we were kids. Evidently the officers of the ship have been using it. Dad wanted to put in concrete steps, but he never quite got around to it. He hesitated. Shall we leave our coats here? I shook my head. Our white bodies, clad only in trunks and boots, would gleam too clearly against the wet mud. The coats we wore were at least something of camouflage. That slip and slide down the cliff was an experience I should not want to repeat. But the path was less dangerous than, what with the rain and the wind and the mud, we might have anticipated. So after what seemed endless hours, we were on the solid rock that formed the base of the cliff and the boundary of the cove. Swim for it, said Tim, and we shed our coats and slipped silently into the water. Not that silence was necessary. The wind seemed to whip over our heads, loudly protesting its disappointment at its not being able really to disturb the waters of this landlocked cove. The rain beat about us, slapping the water up into our eyes. But we knew it was all for the best of luck, for there was no light on the ship except for two lanterns on the mastheads, and we had the happy hope that whoever manned the ship had by the rain and storm been forced down into their bunks. The ship's ladder swung close to the water. We pulled it down carefully, and mounted with all the caution we could muster. Hopefully we tried out our flashes against the palms of our hands. They glowed reassuringly. Yet even as they did, we knew that we dared not use them until we were sure that there would be no interference. "'Wait here. I'll take the forecastle,' I said, motioning toward the small sector evidently set aside for the crew. "'Not on your life,' said Tim. It was time to restore discipline, and I restored it. "'Lieutenant Erkingwold. I commanded. You will hold this deck until my return, which will be immediately. I slipped down the narrow companionway, pushed open the closed door, and swaying with the slight movement of the ship, felt my way into what I knew must be the sailors' quarters. In my left hand, my flash, extinguished, in my right, gripped like an offensive weapon, the light wrench. Once inside the door, I stopped, all my faculties keyed above concert pitch. There was a vivid smell of whiskey, bad whiskey at that, but never had a perfume been more reassuring to my nostrils than was this smell. 
whoever lay in that forecastle had been drinking heavily, and was now breathing with a stentorious wheeze that meant deep, perhaps drunken sleep. I listened intently for any variation of tone, the sound of a second sleeper perhaps suddenly disturbed. There was none. So walking on the balls of my naked feet, I moved across the narrow forecastle to where the sleeper lay. My first impulse was to bind him while he was asleep, and thus safely leave him. My second impulse was to consult with Tim. As quietly as I had entered, I left the cabin and rejoined Tim on deck. Hurriedly I told him of my discovery. Then, suddenly, we heard uncertain footsteps behind us. The sailor had staggered out onto the deck. He was half turned away from us, and he was looking around him in bewilderment. Quickly, Tim and I stepped behind him, and while Tim pinioned the sailor's arms, I looked about for a rope. But to bind him, I thought, would be telltale evidence. We compromised by blindfolding him with a rag that I found on deck. Tim and I seemed to be thinking the same thoughts. With amazing speed, we had the man back in his bunk in the cabin, Tim holding him down. Though the man was still groggy, I decided on extreme precaution. I had brought the wrench with me. Now I brought it down on his temple, with emphasis, not in any sense dangerously, but with power to compel sleep, and the hope that, awakened from his drunken stupor, he would consider his strange adventure a sleepwalking nightmare brought about by too much bad liquor. He groaned once, pitched convulsively, and then breathed on a tone that seemed to drop a full octave. We removed the blindfold. Now almost certain that the place was otherwise empty, we swept the remaining five bunks with the flashlight. They were empty of human occupants, yet each of them was cluttered with an array of gear that indicated, beyond need of argument, that the crew numbered five seamen, in addition to the captain and the mate. We slipped back onto the deck to clear our heads and decide on our next move. Below, I suddenly commanded, and we cut across the deck to the companionway that led to the engine room. As we did, I stumbled and banged my toe villainously against something very cold and hard and brutal. Only with the greatest act of my will did I succeed in holding back a cry of pain. The engine they're tinkering with, Tim said, and together we sank down beside it. Ignoring the pain in my toe, I ran my hands experimentally over the engine. As I did so, I felt accumulating on my hands a film that spelled rust. Rust on the engine of a ship like this? I almost laughed in the darkness, and Tim almost laughed too as he sat back suddenly on his heels and let out a relief gust of breath. Recognize it? An old automobile engine, even to the old-fashioned hand clutch. He was right, a decoy if there ever was one. A booby trap to distract the casual traveler who might from the top of the cliff look down at the ship's mechanic at work on, well, some sort of engine. We had reached the certainty that there was no one else on that ship. So we used our flashes as we plunged down the cabinway into the darkness of the well below. We found the engine room directly under our feet, spick and span and shining in every detail of brass and steel. And there stood the engine without the slightest sign of damage, ready and waiting for the command that would turn its wheel and send it smoothly through the sea. What in thunder? I muttered. That's just it. Not a thing wrong with it. Faking. That's what they're doing. Faking. But why? Then with the energy and thoroughness of moles canvassing a new tunnel, we ransacked that ship. We shot our light into every corner. We opened every chest that we could lay our hands on, and found that nothing was locked, except a few chests that probably contained logbooks or liquor. Only one thing puzzled us. In what was evidently the main saloon, we found one kit that could have meant nothing to a sailor, and that would ordinarily be purposeless on a ship. The kind of electrical wire that is used to string phones, they wrapped about a light drum. There must have been thousands of yards of it, unused, absolutely new. But why telephone wire? Why wires of any sort? And where were the rest of the crew, now that we knew the officers slept in arrow anchorage, and the one guardian, or decoy, or sentinel, or somnambulist lay heavily drunk with the double punch of his whiskey and the tap of my wrench? We climbed back on deck, found the ladder, dropped quietly over the side, and then the fury of the rain swam back to the shore. I looked at Tim in the darkness as he slipped into his coat and thrust his feet into his shoes. I rather hesitated before I put my own heavy boots on over that battered toe. Well, I whispered in the darkness, what did we get for this night's work? You got nothing. I got a toe that's yelling its blooming head off. Through the storm that seemed to howl mockingly about us, we retraced our shadowy way to Arrow Anchorage, through the dim protecting shadow of the hedges, and finally to our rooms. 
Good night, I whispered, and I hardly knew whether Tim answered me, as I sank dead with exhaustion onto the bed. It was still dark when I felt someone shaking me furiously. Luke, the voice whispered. I sat up in bed and squinted my tired eyes to see that it was Tim leaning over me. What a fool I am, he cried. What a fool! If you mean a fool to wake me at this hour of the night, I mumbled in frank acquiescence. Correct. For forgetting why we used to play there all summer long when we were youngsters. He wakes me up in the middle of the night to play kid games, I mocked, addressing the unresponsive air. Played where? In the cave, he whispered. That's it. All the time I'd forgotten the one place we should have looked for them. In the cave. And though at that hour of the night it didn't make sense, I was soon to find out that Tim had turned my eyes down the dark passageway along which lay danger and the solution of our mystery. End of chapter 4 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 5 of Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord S.J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 5 With the coming of morning, I was a little more willing to talk with Tim about this all important, or utterly unimportant, cave of his. I must admit that when in the dead of night he had sprung it on me, I had tossed it back into his lap with complete disinterest. If it turned out to be another Alibaba's cave, or the only rival to Mammoth, I'm not interested, I said. Go to sleep. We'll talk in the morning. Nobody's going to run off of the cave on a night like this. And I had rolled over, drooping down into a cave of sleep. But as I was fumbling for a tie the next morning, Tim knocked at the connecting door and came into my room. For a man who'd been playing around in a storm like last night's, and searching a suspicious ship, he'd look remarkably chipper. I turned back to look at my own haggard face in the mirror, and I regarded myself with acute distaste. "'You look fit, young fellow,' I commented. "'Now aren't you glad you slept and saved the cave for this morning?' I motioned to the bright sun. "'And a nice morning it is for caves or anything else.' He sat down in the window seat, looking out toward the sea. "'I wonder,' he mused, "'if that cave means anything, or if it's just a full hunch.' "'Explain the hunch.' I invited, seating myself opposite him and lighting a preprandial cigarette. And we'll see what it sounds like to a total stranger. It really wasn't much of a hunch, just Tim's sudden recollection that the shore of the cove held a hidden entrance to a cave. As kids, he and his playmates had putted around the opening. But so far as he knew, no one had ever explored the cave beyond the entrance. How far back it wound, where it went, how big it was, these were more than he could even guess. "'So what?' I asked, rather bored with this rehash of youthful memories. "'So nothing, maybe,' he answered. "'But also, whatever use the rest of the crew might make of it. "'The rest of the crew is not on board ship. "'Evidently they do not go to the village. "'Where are they? "'I suggest the cave.' "'But why?' I persisted. "'Smuggling? "'Sounds pretty silly these days. "'Piracy is old-fashioned.' and prohibition has long been repealed. Arms? For whom? Dope? Not likely. What use in the world would a cave be unless the sailors became tired of sleeping in their narrow bunks, and decided to sleep on dry, or more probably, on a night like last night, wet land? I still think, Tim mused while the ash of his cigarette grew longer and longer. Let it maul, I suggested. This is sure. As long as the ship is there, we can't go exploring the cave without looking mighty suspicious, and perhaps a little ridiculous. Unless, of course, we could dress in rompers or play suits and pretend we're children from the village. The breakfast bell interrupted my slow-arriving retort. Beth joined us on the landing near the profane chapel, and the three of us walked down together. In the reception hall, the valet was waiting for us, his face twisted in an obnoxious smile. "'Your boots are not yet cleaned.' he said softly. I saw Tim flush. I know my young cheeks flamed with fury. Who told you to touch our boots? I demanded. Do you mean to say you invaded our rooms, removed our boots? His shrug seemed to move the ugly weight on his shoulders. I am an early riser, he said. Naturally, when you came in last night, or this morning. He seemed, even with that soft voice of his, to punch the last two words. You left mud across the rugs. I was sure your boots must be muddy, too. 
as indeed they were. So I took them from your rooms without disturbing you. You slept so soundly you were not disturbed. Very soundly indeed. It took a combination of caution and grace to prevent my slapping him across his smiling mouth. Beth looked at us quizzically. In that storm, last night, she said, softly, too. Perhaps the sound of conversation in the dining room had made all of us pitch our voices low. Even so, in my tense fury, I leaned close to the valet. I was one step above him, so he had to lift his face on an oblique slant towards mine. I don't suppose by any chance, I asked tensely, that you also clean out the guest's briefcases. Boots, sir, just boots, he replied. I shall not trouble again to do what I thought you would regard as a favor. And he was gone without another word or look or gesture. What does that mean? Beth whispered. We'll tell you after breakfast, Tim answered, and slipped her hand into the crook of his elbow. The three of us entered the dining room. The captain and the mate were breakfasting with Tim's uncle. We took our places after we had helped ourselves, English style, to the food that stood ready on the buffet. Captain Smith was expansive to the bursting point. I have been thanking your good uncle again, he said, for delightful hospitality. By midnight, I'm sure our ship will be ready for the sea. An old sailor tradition, you know, sailing at midnight. We really had better luck than we hoped for. By midnight, I'm sure the engine will be ready. And I really mustn't keep my wife waiting, you know. Of course, sailors' wives are used to waiting. He stopped suddenly and rose gallantly. Madame Leclerc had entered, and was walking toward her place at the opposite end of the table. It wasn't her custom to come to breakfast. Yet today— Ah, oh, sailors' wives, she sighed dramatically. They are like prima donna's husbands, unhonored, neglected, and unsung. And the conversation became general, divided on a five-to-one basis, with Madame Leclerc carrying the five balance, and without real opposition. But as we all rose from the breakfast table, I took over, knowing that Tim would follow my lead. Do you mind, Captain, if Miss Henley and the Lieutenant and I walk down to the cove with you? We'd like to see your ship. I almost choked on that last sentence, for just as I had completed it, the valet appeared in the doorway. He paid no attention to me, or to what I'd said, but he walked to his place in back of Tim's uncle's chair. Not by any flicker of interest or amusement did he indicate that he knew we had made our acquaintance with the ship last night. The instant suspension, as I watched the valet, gave Captain Smith time to heliograph the mate, and then turn his smiling attention on me. "'Really, Captain Foster,' he said, "'you mustn't think me a discourteous host, but our ship is in such disorderly shape, what with the broken engine and the other repairs, and that cliff is so steep, muddy, and dangerous, that I'd advise you to wait until, let's say, this evening? Not at all, said I heartily. We'll just walk to the cove and watch you go aboard. We know so little about ships, the three of us, that a long-distance view will be just as good as a close view. Anyhow, it's just for the walk. We have work to do. Some trifling stuff for the government. Very interesting, by the way, interjected the uncle, and very secret. Splendid, splendid. Let's meet, say, in ten minutes in the reception hall. The captain was hardy with the hardiness born of intense relief. Heavy shoes, I instructed Beth, and I proceeded to my room. When I opened my door, there in the center of the room, fronting me, almost insolently, were my heavy boots of the preceding night, shined to a polish so high that they might have served to send heliographs across a mile of ocean. The captain took Beth's arm solicitously and guided her across the wet garden. The morose, silent mate fell in with Tim and myself. We left the burden of the conversation to the captain, who turned out to be a male counterpart of Madame Leclerc. We learned so much of the charm of his waiting wife that I began to believe she did not so much as exist. And he talked so enthusiastically of his proposed trip to Florida that I wondered how north he might really be intending to sail. When we reached the cliff that topped the cove, the captain's voice rose perceptibly in tone, and twice or three times he laughed so loud at some trifling witticism worth no more than a smile that I had fresh doubts. Was he, like a seaman, from force of habit, talking into the wind? Or was he talking loud enough to be heard by anyone who might be working on the ship or near the cove? Outside the harbor the waves were still pounding. A white network of spume tossed high into the air at each breaker. 
and there on the deck our friend of the preceding night was busily at work on that defunct automobile engine. He lifted for us a hand that seemed to be following merely a grooved routine. In it he brandished a monkey wrench, and he pointed with it first to call our attention, and then to indicate the motor at his feet. Broken, he shouted, becoming fine. Then he squinted sharply. Was it the bright light of the sky hurting a brain that had been soaked with bad whiskey and dulled by a steel wrench? Was it surprise and alarm at the sight of visitors with the officers? Was it merely an effort to focus his bleary eye on the five people who were peering down at him over the edge of the cliff? Looks as if he had a lot of work still to do on it, the captain volunteered. Well, we'd better be helping him, if we're to sail tonight. And may there be no moaning at the bar when I put out to sea. No doubt about it, he had all the stale quotations, I thought. Sorry I can't invite you down for a spot of tea or a cocktail, but... He gestured toward the man who was now hard at the work of twisting bolts on an engine that had never seen a ship until it was planted there on the deck. Then he and the mate began the slippery descent of the path Tim and I had traveled on the preceding night. We leaned over the cliff and waved at him, but as I looked down my eye noted tracks that made me jump with excitement. I caught Tim's elbow and pressed it, gesturing only with a quick turn of my head. He followed my indication and noted my discovery. Along the shore were deep, regular indentations that dug into the soft mud of the beach, for the storm had washed down upon the rocky ledge soft earth from the cliff. There was no mistaking the marks. Someone had quite recently rolled up the beach and across the land the heavy cylinders of telephone wire we had seen on the preceding night on the ship and the cylinder had made clear marks as it had evidently bounced along its muddy way. I know I was leaning too far forward for safety, but as I did so, I saw that the marks came right up to the cliff itself, and then completely disappeared. It was as if, at that point, some giant bird had swooped down and lifted the heavy drum of wire up to its rocky ire. Or into the cave, I thought, and I knew that precisely the same thought had been born in Tim's mind. He'd been right. That cave was important. But what in the world would telephone wire be doing in an unexplored cave? The captain and the mate had reached the shore. A small dinghy that I had not noticed before, and should not have used, even if I had seen it swung in the shelter of a tall boulder. They unloosed the rope, waved up to us, and then put out toward their ship. We answered their wave, and then sauntered away, looking for all the world like three young people, with nothing on their mind but a holiday, and the pleasure of one another's company. It was an uneventful day. We drove to the village on the chance of getting word of the crew, swam for a bit where the ocean rolled cold and gray up the village's public beach, ate a leisurely lunch in the tea shop, played some easy tennis on the courts, now miraculously dry, and lazed on the terrace as the autumnal sun sank behind the anchorage. Before dinner, Tim and I made a brave pretense of working a bit on the false plans, which we slipped back into the briefcase, putting it in its obvious hiding place. We were all there for dinner, the captain the mate, the ladies, Tim's uncle, and Tim and I. The weather had turned quite warm, and the broad windows of the dining room were flung open to their full width. Madame Leclerc and the captain bid against each other for conversation, so there was left to Tim and Beth a happy silence in which to find each other, to the uncle for opportunity to concentrate on food, and to me a social vacuum about which I could move and play with my own muddled thoughts. Suddenly I turned to the captain for another shot in the dark. Captain, I inquired, do you believe in ghosts? Tim's uncle winced and turned in my direction, a face heavy with frowns. Most certainly, the seaman replied. What sailor doesn't? Well, you may have the pleasure of seeing a ghost before you leave. Nonsense, stuff and nonsense, growled the uncle. Perhaps, I said, but if tonight you should happen to see a scarlet archer walking along the line of that rising lawn and winging an arrow in your direction. Madame the clerk jumped to her feet. Was it drama or genuine fright? Or was she looking for some excuse to leave us? Don't, she cried. That horrible ghost. I'm afraid of it. Desperately afraid. And she ran headlong from the room. Beth jumped to her feet, dropped her napkin at her place, and followed her employer with all possible speed. We men had risen, all that is, except the uncle, who sat glowering at me. Why did you have to do that? he demanded angrily. It's bad enough for the lot of you to see a ghost or pretend a hallucination, but to use it to frighten the women. You, 
he cried, in the voice of sharp command, and the valet appeared as promptly as if the word you had been his given or family name. Bring the cigars and bottles in at once. Send the butler to his quarters. My nephew and his friend, he embraced us with a twist of his head, are going to their rooms for the evening. More patriotic work, I'm sure. See that they have coffee there, if they wish it. We don't, I shot, stung with this dismissal. Go to bed and leave men to talk to men. This last clearly took in himself and the two seamen. Tim and I rose to our feet. We were seething. But you can't tell a man in a wheelchair what you think of him, even when you are thinking it with bitterness and fury. You can only walk out of the room with what little dignity is left in you, and behind the protection of your own closed door, first foam over bitterly, and then laugh yourself back to a state of normal nerves and humor. Again we sat near the window of my room, looking out into the night. Again the sky was clear and cool, an autumnal sky with a slight suggestion of remoteness, as the mist arose from the sea and the ground and bathed the landscape in a ghostly fog. We talked a little and were silent much. I think that I was almost drowsing when I felt Tim's hand grip my knee. I didn't need the compulsion of his gesture to turn my attention toward that little stage across which we had seen the archer play his mysterious scene. And there he was again. Around the little summer house there seemed to be a sort of solid bank of mist, yet out of it he stepped, clean and clear, his tall hat rising sharply against the pale sky, his legs striding in measured steps along the spine of the mound. Even as we watched this ghostly figure slipping through the autumn fog, we were conscious of the rumble of the men's voices rising from the dining room below us. We were not conscious of words or sentences or sense, just the blending of human sounds that indicated conversation but gave no inkling of the context. Strange how one can do two things at once, watch and listen, see the swift passage of a drama, and hear the undertones of speech that seem to be accompanying it, though they bear no part in it. The archer had reached his spot, not a score of yards from the summer house. As if to test his bow, slowly, with the delayed action of a somnambulist or of an athlete in a slow-motion newsreel, he fitted an arrow to his string and shot it high into the air. We could trace its course against the sky, see it rise, rise, rise in flight, and then fall almost upon the figure that had shot it. Then with a rhythm that was the perfection of athletic skill, he pulled an arrow from his quiver and shot it straight at us. I know I threw myself back against the casement. I knew that Tim needed no warning to do the same. Between us cut the arrow in deadly flight, to bury itself with a short, vigorous impact in the wood of the wall beyond. Then without pause the archer slipped the second arrow into the string, and I saw him in a single sweeping gesture aim and fire toward what I knew was the dining room window. There was just one scream, sharp and terror-ridden. I heard heavy sounds as of chairs being thrown down. Then leaping from the window, I flung myself across the room, down the stairs, into the reception hall, and through the connecting archway into the dining room. Tim was after me, a shadow clinging to my heels. The captain and the mate were standing, amazement on their faces. But Tim's uncle seemed to have shriveled to half his size. Perhaps in an instinct of self-protection, he had guided his chair around the table, so that it stood between the two overturned chairs that had lately been occupied by the seamen. The three of them were facing the lawn and the arch of the window. Only now the uncle was crouched back in his chair, his face a living mask of terror. I looked toward the wall, expecting to see the arrow in its usual place. It wasn't there. I caught the fact that one of the candles on the table was guttering, almost extinguished, by the arrow as it cut through. My eye, traveling from the candle to Tim's uncle, lighted on the cause of the uncle's terror. He was dressed in a loose dressing gown that he much affected, and the sleeve, the right sleeve at that, was pinned to the wood of the chair by the arrow, which even yet seemed to quiver from the impact. "'After him!' cried Tim's uncle, with what looked like a foam on his mouth. "'Ghost or murderer, get him! You fools, get him!' As if he had cracked a whip over our head, the four of us sprang through the open window. Without need for preconcerted plan, we fanned out across the garden, using the summer house as our central point, and each of us taking one of four paths that covered every inch of the garden. Tim drove left, the two seamen to my right, and I straight for the summer house. No stopwatches clocked our flight that night. 
but I know we made the distance in new records, especially as I jumped straight for that column structure that stood so clear and clean against the grey-green sky. But it was speed to no avail. I reached the summer house and leaped into the shadow of the pillars, which were open, except for a low concrete balustrade, hardly more than waist-high, that circled three sides of the building. The stone floor was noisy under my feet, but the place was as empty as a platter lately served to a hungry hound. I looked down the slope toward the hedge that encircled the garden. No signs of an outlet there. And even as I surveyed the grounds, Tim came along, beating the hedge to his left with a branch he had pulled from a tree, and the two seamen met him, beating the hedge along the other side. We met in the shadow of the summer house. Not a sign of him, said Tim. The captain's tin was just a little too awestruck. Vanished like a ghost. Perhaps like a ghost is just the phrase for it, I agreed and the silent mate uttered one guttural snort that might have been fear, agreement, or a disgust with the whole proceedings. Well, said the captain, as if taking command, there's nothing we can do except return. So feeling a little foolish and highly disconcerted, we recrossed the garden, heading this time for the bright horseshoe of light that marked the open window. Tim's uncle still sat in his chair, the arrow still pinning his sleeved arm to the wood of the chair. "'You fools!' he greeted us. "'You fools!' Then for the first time his left hand gripped the arrow that pinioned him. Immediately he screamed in fright and pulled his hand away. He held it out as if in horror at what he felt, and we saw that it was bloody red. "'Blood!' he cried. "'My blood or his?' We had no idea what he meant by the or his, nor had we time to ask him. The captain had taken the arrow from his hand and sniffed it. He laughed a little grimly, but in evident relief. "'Not blood this time,' he said. "'Just fresh, then paint.' Of a sudden an idea struck me. What did we know of what went on in the valet's house? Where was he now? Had the archer escaped there? "'Tim!' I cried, in command, and plunged again through the window, with Tim again at my heels. I circled the house and headed for the porter's lodge, which housed the valet. A dim light was burning in his window— I raced the distance, paying little attention to my loss of breath. Bursting against his door, I lift my clenched fist and pound it. There was no answer. I pounded it again. This time I heard the heavy drag of feet across the floor, and then the door was flung open. The valet stood in the doorway, his back to the light, an ostentatious fist rubbing sleep out of his eyes. "'Is he here?' I demanded. But even as I asked it, I knew the folly of my question." Between the summer house, where we had last seen the archer, and this porter's lodge, there were hundreds of feet of lawn, over which no one could possibly have moved, without our seeing him all the way, and for that matter, colliding with him in our search. Oh, yes, he might, if indeed he was the ghost, had fled through the air, and dropped down in the valet's presence. The utter lack of interest displayed by the valet was insulting enough. How can I say, if I don't know who you mean by he? he demanded. I pushed by him into the house. "'How dare you?' he began, as if he were not a valet, and I not a guest in his master's house. Then he slunk back against the wall, watching me with an insolent grin. The living room was lined with books. Odd setting, I thought, for a valet. Beyond was a bedroom, in which a nightlight burned. There was a small kitchen, immaculately clean, apparently little used. Around the tiled bathroom, towels hung in orderly precision and that was all. I flung open a closet in the bedroom. I even demeaned myself by looking under the bed, at which I heard him laugh that ugly, insolent laugh. Tim had been standing near the valet, as though to grab him if he made a move. But the man merely slouched against the wall, watching me in cool amusement. That's all, I said, heading for the door. Good night. May I offer my guests a cup of coffee? I've no liquor, naturally, so I can't offer you highballs. I slammed the door behind Tim and myself, and left his unfinished sentence mocking our retreat. We entered the dining room once more through the lighted arch. This time we faced an even more amazing picture. The butler stood at the end of the table. The three men were looking at him in fascinated wonder. He was holding in his hand a long, curved bow. "'Where did you get that?' I demanded, one nervous bundle of interest. "'If you please, sir,' he replied, in true butler circumlocution. I'm a bit on the FBI side myself, if I may say so, 
and when I heard the commotion, I quickly decided to search unoccupied rooms. I suppose, I interjected ironically, you found that in my closet or Lieutenant Tim's. No, sir, he replied quietly. I found it in Miss Beth Henley's closet. You'd think that Tim had been struck in the face. It took some handling of myself not to sag into a chair. Yes, it was possible, I thought, at least tonight. She was not with us when the archer appeared. At that distance, could one tell a tall, slender girl from a slim man in that fantastic disguise? But Tim's anger surged. How dare you invade a young woman's room after she has retired? Begging your pardon, sir, said the butler. That's just it. Miss Henley was not in her room when I found the bow. We stood petrified, unable to think of another question or make a coherent remark. I'll take that, if you will be good enough to let me have my property. It was Beth's voice. We turned to see her standing in the doorway that led to the reception hall. Quietly she walked over and in all calmness took the bow out of the butler's unresisting hand. She was dressed in a long, light-colored tailored velvet dressing gown. She was very pale, but utterly self-possessed. Tim leaped to her side. Beth, he cried, what does this mean? Just, she replied, that I happened to be an archery enthusiast, champion of the coast, if I may brag a little, when I was a senior at St. Elizabeth's. I brought the stupid thing down here, but when I heard of your ghostly archer, or your real one, I hid it in my closet. Silly of me, but just the same. Of course, cried Tim. Then, barked my friend's uncle, leaning forward as if to pierce the girl with his eyes, where were you when you were not in your room? Sitting up with Madame Leclerc, replied Beth unhesitatingly. I took command again. It's easy enough to prove. With Tim and, if you wish, one of you men, I'll go to Madame Leclerc's room and ask her to confirm Beth's story. The captain followed me as I ran up the stairs, Tim this time a little in advance. We knocked lightly on Madame Leclerc's door. There was no answer. In his anxiety, Tim knocked with insistence the second time. Again, no answer. Finally, we both pounded, and in reply heard slow movements, and then a woman's voice. Who's there, and what do you want at this hour of the night? Madam, I replied, if we may just enter and ask you a question. I named the three of us. There was an interminable delay. Even in my anxiety I was amused as I fancied the ex-prima donna arraying herself for these midnight visitants. "'Come in,' she said at last, and we entered. She lay in bed, an exquisite dressing-gown about her shoulders. "'Sorry to bother you, Madame Leclerc,' I said, acting as spokesman. "'But Miss Henley was,' she says, with you just a moment ago. Madame Leclerc seemed to hesitate. "'Naturally,' she answered at last. If she says that it is the case, no doubt it is. But I fell asleep almost as soon as I left dinner tonight, and I awoke only when you rapped on my door. She is an honest girl, of course, but I can't, in this case, do more than say just that. End of chapter 5 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter Six of Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Six. When we regained the dining room, Beth was still standing there, her bow in hand, facing the glowering uncle and the silent mate. Her mute inquiry left us helpless, but it was the captain who saved the situation. Miss Henley, he said gallantly. I have seen enough to know that you are absolutely guiltless. Thank you, she said. Then with a swift look of puzzled inquiry on her face, she disappeared up the stairs. Again the captain took command. It's midnight, he said, and my men will be waiting to set sail. My thanks to you, Mr. Erkenwold, for your great hospitality. My compliments to you, gentlemen, and my hope that we shall meet again. Mr. Johnson, our ship is waiting. It was an exit that completely distracted all of us from the question of Beth and the archer. Almost it seemed as if somewhere along the line we had cleared Beth of any suspicion. I wonder if Tim's uncle had noticed that we said nothing. 
The uncle wheeled his chair into the hall. Tim and I followed along. There were brief farewells to the seamen, and the officers strode off across the lawn toward their ship. Slowly the uncle closed the door. Then he wheeled his chair with a speed I had not dreamed possible in him. "'Who's doing this to me?' he whispered, his voice low and tense. "'Do you know, either of you?' He stopped for an answer. We had none to give. Then he leaned far forward in his chair. "'Don't think I didn't notice that you two said nothing about the girl. Nothing. Before heaven, if she's the archer, woman or no woman.' And he shot his chair at almost express speed across the reception hall and off toward his apartments. We waited until we heard the door slam. Then, without a word, we both leaped for the open window in the lawn. Again, though, it meant more time. We followed the line of the shadowy hedges. The two seamen were just mounting the rise of the lawn softened hill. We kept them clearly in sight, but made certain that they could not see us. It was not fun playing sleuth across a still wet lawn, and then over a muddy road, dressed as we were in dinner jackets and stiff linen. We turned up our collars, glad that our black clothes were additional camouflage, and were within easy sight when the two seamen reached the cliff and scrambled down the seawall to the cove. We followed, hanging just far enough over the edge in order to see, with a minimum chance of being seen. A sailor in the dinghy was waiting for them at shore's edge. They were rowed out to the waiting ship. The slow pulse of the engines rose in the silence. As they mounted the ladder, two seamen gave them a salute, snappy, professional, not by any manner or means, the slipshod salute of coastal sailors. Then one of them dropped back down the ladder, was rowed back to the shore, and jumped to land. I'll watch the ship, I whispered to Tim. You watch the man. The dinghy made its return trip. I heard the sound of anchors being lifted. Lights sprang into existence, to bow and stern, and the slim, graceful little ship, under an expert helmsman's touch, found a narrow opening in the overlapping arms of the harbor, cut out to sea, and steamed southeast. As I turned to Tim, I saw that he too was following the ship. "'What about that sailor that was left behind?' I demanded. He melted into the cliff. "'At the mouth of the cave?' "'Precisely, at the mouth of the cave.' Tim gripped my arm. "'Let's follow him.' "'Not tonight, nor tomorrow. Whatever his business, he's bound to lie quiet for two days or more, until the ship is far, far on its way, and any connection between him and the others has been stretched by time to the breaking point.' Tim nodded, and we plodded back through the darkness. Beth was waiting for us, standing at the open door of her room. "'I'm so worried.' she whispered, clinging to Tim. You don't think I'm the archer, that I have anything to do with the archer. Darling, cried Tim, and in that word he made an act of faith and a profession of love. Though in her case I had no right to use so short a form, I made my act of loyalty with equal sincerity. By the horrible coincidence, she cried, Tim, it's true, I love archery. I brought the bow and a quiver full of arrows with me. But when I heard the legend of the archer, I put them aside. This I'm sure of, though, she whispered. It was Madame Leclerc who suggested to the butler that he search my room. Does she want me suspected? Does she herself suspect me? What does it mean? Since none of us knew, there was just one thing to do, sleep on the whole problem. And we did it, though my rest was fitful as the pieces of this jigsaw puzzle jumbled about in my troubled head. We slipped away, the three of us, for Sunday Mass. Tim's uncle did not appear for breakfast or for lunch. Several times I met the valet going to or returning from the uncle's apartments, and always he stepped inside with a show of deference that was like an insult thrown in my face. During the afternoon, Tim again confiscated the small car, and again we ran down to the village. We came to a stop before the sheriff's office and found that jovial, if minor minion of the law, relaxing, according to his wont, at his disorderly desk. The sheriff clearly regarded a desk as the proper repository for unanswered mail, old newspapers, last week's collars, his hat, and his well-filled shoes. "'Anything further on that tramp?' I inquired. "'Nothing further to be expected,' he laughed, taking my preferred cigar with a nod of thanks. "'Just keeping him cold down at the morgue. We've got a nice modern morgue, by the way. After a few days, burial, and that's all of that.' 
We left him and headed out for the seawall. We stopped the car on the promontory, where the sea, in leisurely fashion, beat its lazy rhythm against the unresponsive cliffs. Carefully we examined the pieces of our puzzle once again. Did they belong together? Were they merely disjointed events, each having no bearing on the others? There was the phantom archer, ghost, or madman, or murderer in the making. There was a tramp who came by midnight and left with a broken arrow in his heart. There was a boat that pretended to be in distress, and clearly was not in distress. There was a cave, and a house with a legendary ghost, and the three of us like babes in the woods, trying to fit the parts into a unity that they were perhaps never meant to have. An uncle's valet, said Tim, as if he were reaching a climax. Yes, the valet, I agreed. Do you remotely suppose, asked Beth, almost as if she was afraid to have suggested, that he might be the archer? If you stop to think, he's never been with us when the arrows came. Tim protested. Why, the archer's tall and slim and young-looking. This fellow was bent and crooked, with an unmistakable hump on his back, and old and ugly. Beth nodded in quick agreement. She seemed almost ashamed to have made the suggestion. Yet she laid her fingers on something that had forced itself into my mind again and again. Utterly ridiculous as any identity between the two might seem. Still... Then I worked out our plan. That night the three of us would each play sentry, be on the watch for the archer's appearance. Only this time, if he came, he would meet, not with a group of frightened people, but with three alert watchers, each with a part to play, each with one, and only one detail of the job to do. And if he escaped us... Madame Leclerc had her dinner served early in her room. She was tired, she said, and upset by the strange goings-on in the house. Tim's uncle sent no word. Tim, Beth, and I stood at table for a few minutes after the butler had sounded the gong, and then, tired of waiting, sat ourselves down and told the butler to serve us. We liked it better that way, anyhow, just the three of us. So we were quite happy and much at peace by the time the coffee had been served in the living room and the radio was bringing in the music of Tim's favorite dance band. The fates were, I might say, often gentle with Tim, when he had the one and only girl to dance with, blessed if the radio didn't come through with the one and only orchestra. Yet, just as they were swinging into a Hawaiian number that simply reeked of moonlight and palms and moon over silvery sands, we felt the death head walking. Through the doorway on those silent wheels of the chair came Tim's uncle, the chair propelled by the valet, never particularly attractive even in the best lights, and after the most restful night and day, Tim's uncle at this moment looked like something that had been dug up from a not-too-fresh grave. He was pale, tense, his eyes red from sleeplessness, his lips taut and bloodless. Once more, he began without introduction, will you accept my invitation to go to New York? Uncle, replied Tim, with cool politeness, that's a strange invitation. How can you invite a person to go away? I hate quibbles, and plays on words worse than puns, growled the uncle then suddenly gripping his chair in tight, gray-claw hands. All right, then. I'm telling you to go. This joke has gone far enough. I don't believe in ghosts. Never did. But as long as you... And he leveled the thin, wrinkled finger at Tim. Stay here. None of us is safe. Whatever, or whoever that midnight marauder is, he's after blood. Well, I'm too old, too nervous, too upset for this. His voice trailed off uncertainly. It was low and fierce when he again flung it in our faces. Who's responsible for this nonsense? That girl with her bow and her lying excuse. Uncle. Tim's voice was full of warning. Or you, he ruled on Tim, who have never forgiven me because my brother left me his money. He was my father, too, Tim reminded him. What difference? It was my advice that made him rich. My brains were back of his beginnings. He owed it to me. I don't know what made me lift my eyes to the valet who stood behind the chair. What I saw in his face was beyond my power to read, but I was for a second glad that in this whole scene I was audience rather than actor, and that the hates I felt swirling around me were directed, like the arrows of the archer, at someone other than myself. Glad, that is, until I realized that the look on the valet's face was probably meant for Tim. Then I recalled that I was, not audience, but someone likely to be involved in this whole drama, until the ringing down of someone's curtain. I pray that it might not be Tim's or Beth's. That was all of that scene. 
Without another word, the valet swung his master from the living room, and both were gone. Only now the rhythm had been jarred from the music. Young love had been too close to old, vicious hate. The romance was swallowed up in the nearness of bleak reality. And we were three young people with a task to do, and not much stomach for the doing of it. Beth took the first lines. She pretended great weariness and went off to bed. Tim and I played a bit of rummy and drank the remains of the thermos of coffee. Then, with ostentatiously glad good nights, we headed for our rooms. Silence fell upon the house. Darkness dropped over the scene. Then Tim opened the door between our rooms and slipped in to join me on the window seat. We did not dare smoke for fear that the lights would be seen from the grounds below. We simply waited until the clock beat its interminable quarters into unendurable hours and midnight approached. Below, splashed upon the lawn in an oblong of golden mistiness, was the light that fell, as I knew, from Tim's uncle's window. He read late, or did whatever he did at that hour of the night. As the third quarter struck, with fifteen minutes left till midnight, we knew it was time to leave our apartment. Tim carried a service revolver, not for any other purpose than to produce the loud noise that was to be our signal. We were dressed, both of us, in black, no white linen showing, hats far down over our eyes. As we opened my door, Beth opened hers. The hands of the two young people met briefly, and then I saw Beth slip up the stairs to the window from which we had kept our watch during the night that we first saw the ship. We men stole down the stairs on tiptoe. At the door leading into the garden we parted. Tim slunk back into the darkness of the building, crouching a little like a runner on his mark. I cut to the corner of the building from which I could see the night light in the porter's lodge. The light had evidently burned all night in the bedroom of the valet. We were all now at our post, Tim ready to make a swift run toward the archer. I said to pounce down upon the house of the valet. Beth watching the entire scene for any detail we might miss and back of us all this time the uncle's apartments lighted almost as if in expectation of a visitant. How the everlasting minutes dragged their weary length of seconds along. I leaned against the building, stiff and chilly and growing sleepier by the minute. I turned alternately toward the rise of ground on which the archer played his role, and then back to watch the dim light in the bedroom of the valet. Noiselessly I beat my hands against my sides, working to fight off sleep. A distant clock chimed twelve quarter after, and then. So swiftly that I could hardly follow it, it happened. Along the spine of the rise walked the archer. I could see the tall feather in his hat, clearly against the sky. I could see the swing of his legs. One swift glance to be sure that the light in the uncle's window still burned, and then with all the speed I had failed to show on the Fordham track team, I lagged it for the valet's house. This time there was no question of knocking at his door. I headed straight for that lighted window, risking everything in my effort to see what was inside. Once I stumbled against low bushes and fell in the damp grass, tearing my hand and soiling the knees of my dress trousers. But I was up again, and then on my hands and knees, before the dimly lit window, pressing my face against the opening, made apparently to let in the air. Why was I so disappointed? Truth to tell, I had expected just this, or something like it. Yet when I saw the hunched figure of the valet lying in bed, a sheet drawn up over the curve of his back, his coarse hair, and unkempt against the white of the linen that covered his pillow, I felt licked. The valet lay asleep under his nightlight at the very moment that that scarlet archer was lifting his arrow to shoot. I rose as quietly as possible, feeling the other failure I was. Clearly the fellow, bad as he seemed, and repellent as his manner might be, was neither the archer nor a confederate of the archer. For surely a confederate was not likely to be sleeping at this very time his alley and friend was bent on a mission of mischief or warning. In my sheer funk I must have walked a dozen paces before I realized that mine was only a third of the drama that was being played on the lawn. In a sharp burst of speed I raced for that corner of the house from which I had started, prepared to see Tim locked in the grip of an adversary, or standing over the fallen body of a foe, or struggling to seize the filmy nebula of a ghostly opponent. I rounded the corner of the house to see nothing. Even the light in the uncle's window was out. The lawn lay dark and shadowy, deeper in blackness where the hedge dipped it into midnight ink, lighter where it rose toward the sky. I looked up at the house. There was not the faintest spark of a light showing, and yet I knew that high up there in that dormer window, Beth was sitting and watching, 
perhaps seeing the very things that might be essential to our solving of this mystery. I did not dare call. Instead I craned out into the darkness, searching every inch of the dimly lighted dawn, prying into the shadows for any shadows that might move or seem different or be not dead night shade, but living people. Where in heaven's name was Tim? Was this archer then a ghost after all? Had the ghost, in furious resentment at hands having been laid upon him, left it Tim with him into the hereafter? The very thought was ridiculous, yet I had to shake myself and rouse my courage before I could pronounce it the ridiculous fantasy it was. Some sudden impulse made me glance back at the porter's lodge. A shadow was moving across the screen. What had wakened that fellow? For it was clearly the shadow of the valet. Before I dared look for Tim, I plunged once more across the garden to the lodge. Down on my hands and knees I went, risking all that I could only guess, to place my eyes against the opening in the window. Attired in a hideously colored nightshirt, the valet was sitting on the side of his bed. He yawned elaborately, stretched out his arms in a travesty of weariness. He seemed to look at the clock on the table near the bed. He poured himself a glass of water from the thermos. Then he rolled into bed, and by the nightlight I saw him resume precisely the position that he had had when a few minutes earlier I had come upon him asleep. What had wakened him? Some sense of nearby movement? Some noise I had inadvertently made? The restlessness of his own filthy conscience? Back I went to my corner of the building, this time sure that I should see nothing. Then I crept along the hedge, first the left hedge, which yielded nothing, then back to the shadow of the building, and across to the hedge on the far side. Some fascination kept me lifting my eyes intermittently towards the summer-house, as if it held the solution to our problems. Then my foot hit something soft. I plunged forward, and I heard under me a very low and very human groan. Terror and anxiety were twin chains pulling me erect. A man lay on the grass in the deep shadow of the hedge. In a second I was down on my knees again, rolling the limp, inert figure on its back. I needed no light to know that it was Tim, living, breathing heavily, but not cold as if he had been hit on the chin with the mallet of the Cornish giant. It was a matter of seconds, however, until he was sitting up, shaking his head to rid it of the pain and mistiness, and there in the darkness beginning to whisper his story. When the archer appeared, I gave him time to reach the center of the rise. Then following our plan, I plunged out into the shadow of the hedge and moved towards him as noiselessly as I could. He clearly did not see or hear me, for as usual he went through the routine of pulling his arrow and shooting it into the air. He reached for a second arrow and aimed it, as far as I could see, at Uncle's lighted room. That was the moment when I leaped forward. I was all set to tackle him below the knees, jumping out from the shadow, running the few yards between us and making that last flying leap. All of a sudden I hit another body and hit it hard. I must have given it my shoulder, for I heard a grunt and then a strangled oath. The archer had shot his arrow, but when he heard the grunt, he turned. We were out of the deep shadow now, I and the man, whoever he was, that I'd hit. The archer looked at us, leaped once, and then... Tim rubbed the top of his head in affectionate interest. I laid my hand gently on the sizable bump that had risen there. I get it. I said understandingly. Well, I got it first, Tim replied sadly, and it was no fun, no fun at all. We had been so wrapped up in our own discomfitures that we had almost forgotten the girl who was waiting there near the upper window. Can you make it? I asked. Tim answered by struggling a little shakily to his feet, taking my arm and following me through the deep shadow of the hedge back into the shadow of the house and thence to the door, the stairs, and up to the third floor where Beth was waiting. What a grand little soldier she'd been, sitting there in that window, waiting, holding the fort when there was darkness all around her, and below, the threat, perhaps of death to the man she loved. As we gingerly opened the door, though, she lost control of that magnificent courage, and threw herself into Tim's arms. "'Tim!' she cried. "'Oh, Tim! I saw him hit you, saw you go down, and for a minute I thought you were dead. Oh, how I've prayed!' You're not hurt, not terribly hurt, are you? Tell me, are you all right? They talked here, reassuring nothings, while I walked to the window. Before me lay the dark lawn on which we had been playing our part so inadequately. 
I felt thwarted as if we were dealing with some person, some powers or forces vastly stronger and cleverer than ourselves. Finally Tim drew back to the deep window seat. She took her place between us and filled in the details of the evening. I saw the archer appear, too. Her voice was very low and tense. He came, as he always comes from the regions of the summer house. My eyes followed him across the rise of lawn, and I saw him take his arrow and draw his bow. Then Tim, oh, I'm so sorry, I turned to find and follow you. I caught sight of you just as you entered the shadow of the hedge, and I forced myself to look back to the archer. Then he came, Tim, that other man. He moved close to the ground, like an animal ready to leap. He had something bright and shining in his hand, something I could see even in the darkness. He, too, was heading, but on what seemed a shortcut, for the archer. I saw him sink on one knee. I saw him raise the bright thing, and then I saw you plunge out, hit him, fall, and I forgot the archer, forgot everything except that you and he were fighting. Then I saw him holding the bright object over his head, saw it descend, and you dropped. Tim, I knew as well as I know my own heart that you were unconscious. I almost screamed. I wanted to rush down to you. Only your orders to stay, no matter what happened, kept me here. Brave girl, whispered Tim, and I was sure he was pressing her hands. But what happened to the archer, I demanded, for that was the thing I wanted to know. Beth shook her head. I was watching Tim, she confessed. I didn't see anything, and when I looked back, he was gone. I sighed. The three of us had been playing our parts, and the three of us had failed. One smart figure from another world, one clever intruder into our lives, had tricked us all. One. No, not one. Two. If it had not been for the other man, Tim would have reached the archer, and right here and now we'd be in possession of a solution to our mystery, or part of it. What was the other man like? I demanded of Beth. Could you see him at all? Did anything about him look familiar? Beth's face, pale as it was in that gloom, seemed to grow paler. If the dead can come to life, she said, almost mystically, can the crippled walk again? What? Tim and I joined in that amazed query. Oh, I must be a fool. I've seen ghosts that may be ghosts, or not at all ghosts. I've seen Tim almost killed, only thank God he lives. But did I see right when I looked at the other man? Tim caught her by the shoulders and put her in a firm, reassuring grip. It was as if he was trying to pour calm and courage and sanity into her soul, and he seemed to be emptying himself in the process. "'Take it easy, darling,' he said. "'I know you're overwrought, but what are you trying to tell us?' With a great intake of breath, she drew into herself all that he tried to give her. "'Undoubtedly I'm mad,' she answered, "'or it was a trick of the darkness. But I could have sworn that the other man, the man who stalked the archer, and who struck you, Tim, was your uncle.' And for some strange reason, neither of us was, I think, even slightly surprised. End of chapter 6 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 7 of Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord S.J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 7 We talked long that night before we finally went to bed. Why is it, Tem argued, that men without faith are most likely to be superstitious? They don't believe in God, but they believe in the most shameless scamps of fortune-tellers. They pay no attention to the Bible, but they hire people to read the lines in their hands or the bumps on their head. They haven't room in their lives for an angel, but have room to fill their lives with ghosts and goblins. They don't believe in the Last Supper, but they are desperately afraid of having thirteen people seated at table. Beth had her head against his shoulder, relaxed safely after the nervous tension of the evening. "'I suppose,' I said, "'it's because men are so incurably religious that they have to believe in something. So if they don't believe in what's true, they believe the more violently in what's false.' "'But don't you believe in ghosts?' Beth asked sleepily. I do. Frankly, I don't know, I answered. I shall not be surprised if I ever do meet a ghost. 
if, for example, the Scarlet Archer turns out to be the real thing. But I shall certainly not be surprised if I go through life without any personal visitations from ghosts or fairies. Beth smiled in the darkness. Do you suppose that one can have a ghost for an in-law? she asked. It was the first time I'd been sure that in the swift light of a holiday, Tim had asked her, and she had said yes. Funny how in the preoccupation with crime and mystery, Tim had forgotten to tell me about the new element of joy in his life. Perhaps he thought that all the world could see it. I don't expect you to adopt my uncle, Tim almost apologized, and the ghost goes with the house, which isn't going to be ours anyhow. So, honey, you're safe enough in marrying an Erkenwald. You'll get only the prosaic, very material me. Then why should I want a ghost? she asked happily. We were sitting at breakfast, the three of us, when Tim's uncle, piloted by the repellent valet, was wheeled into the room. I shan't try to duplicate that scene. It was the scene of the day before, raised to fury, to a pitch that was close to hysteria. No doubt of it, the flight of arrows had played upon his nerves, as the pick of a guitar might in the hands of a madman play upon a tautly strung instrument. But it's you he's after, he cried in all insincerity. The archer, if there is an archer, isn't warning an older Urkenwold of death. He never does. It's the young he loves, the young he comes to shoot. Just bad aim. Just poor shooting. That's what made the arrows graze me. With interest I noticed the tear in the shoulder of his dressing gown. Had the arrow entered there last evening and torn the cloth when, in a writhe of terror, he pulled away? And if it is a murderer, why, asked Tim, in all reasonableness, don't you send for the police? I say in all reasonableness, because that seemed the logical and sensible thing to do. The valet leaned forward over Tim's uncle, and spoke one of his rare sentences. Yes, why don't you? It seemed almost as if it was the uncle's soul that writhed. The police are fools, he cried. I don't want them prying into my affairs. Not, he hastened to add, with suspicious alacrity, that I have any least thing to hide. Nothing whatsoever. I merely hate the police for the stupid, interfering clods they are. But if he comes again, if once again... He left the threat suspended in midair. Was it because he couldn't lay his tongue upon a fitting conclusion? Was it because he thought it would sound more sinister if he did not finish his threat? Wheel me back he ordered his valet, and they disappeared down the passageway as the door swung to behind them. Again our threesome started off in the little car. We took golf clubs along as a cover, and we headed ostensibly for the links. Then we cut back and ran along the seawall road until we were near our cove. We had spotted a clump of trees located half a mile from the cove and back of a curve in the road where we could hide the car from anyone who might be on the shore below. We stowed the car there, walked back in leisurely fashion, glad enough of our golf clothes and shoes, and reconnoitred the now empty cove and the cliff still rough by the feet of the seamen, Tim and me. Lead on, cried Beth cheerfully. I was once a Girl Scout leader. Hills and cliffs are like an easy flight of stairs to me. So indeed it proved. While the two of us men did more than our share of slipping and sliding on the still slick mud, Beth came down after us with a firmness of foot that was as reassuring as it was graceful. We reached the shore of the little cove, and took a minute out for the return of our normal breathing. Then Tim assumed the lead. As I recall, he said, pointing, the mouth of the old cave was about there. At least it was there a long time ago. It was easy to see that he was stumped. He regarded the cliff as might a stranger. He couldn't have been more puzzled in his search for landmarks if we two had exchanged places, and I had been the searcher of these childhood haunts. Queer, he said. I remember there was something like a gash in the side of the cliff, and now the whole thing is covered with shrub and what looked like solid rock. Did you ever hear of camouflage? I asked carelessly. It was an idea, anyhow, whatever it might be worth. Do you think that's possible? he demanded. As if he felt I had really hit on it, he walked back to the edge of the water, got his bearings with a quick survey of the path we had just descended, and headed straight for a solid looking rock over which willows bent, and on which vines had a healthy grip. "'I'd swear it used to be just about here,' he said. "'Well,' Beth volunteered, "'if open sesame still has its power. "'Open sesame!' she commanded, shutting her eyes. "'This is it!' Tim cried, as if the magic words had really done their lock-picking trick. We ran forward to the spot, 
where he was digging furiously behind a huge rock. "'Take it easy,' I warned. "'It is camouflage. Don't spoil it.' It would never do to let the would-be artist who constructed it realize that their work had been tampered with. Indeed, it was a beautiful job. In masterly fashion, rocks had been built up over the mouth, and there had been added a bit of cement and such dirt as created the impression of permanence and age. On closer inspection, however, you could see that the willows had been transplanted, and the vines and shrubbery would no doubt die, with the winter, never to be revived. Careful, I said again, not to let light pour into the cave. If there are people in it, and they see that sudden flash of light, we're sure to have trouble. We worked at the main rock carefully, disturbing it as little as possible, until there was just room enough for us to slip in, one at a time. The thin opening permitted almost no illumination of the cave. We caught the damp, musty, unaired scent that is characteristic of natural caves, and I had to lean over to Beth reassuringly with a, Don't worry, probably no bats, before I felt her release, her tense grip on herself. Quiet, said Tim, and we stood motionless. That wide opening in the big mouth in which we stood should, we thought, provide a kind of telephone receiver for sounds coming from further back in the cave. We listened, letting ourselves grow accustomed to the darkness and the intense quiet. Not a sound rewarded our attention. No use staying unless we use our flashes, I said at length in a whisper. You know this section from your kid days, Tim. Flash around and see what you can find. We crouched back against the far wall, and Tim flashed the light on the walls around him. They were rough, stone and dirt walls, the kind that might once on a time have been the mouth of an underground river flowing into the sea. The light thrust its prying finger up into the ceiling, which rose some twenty or more feet over our heads. It was of the same stone and dirt, no sign of slagmite or slactite, just the rough carvings of an ancient river that had long since done its work and retired to its old folks' home in the sea. Why in the world would anyone want to protect the mouth of so unprepossessing a place with that careful piece of camouflage? You and Beth take the north wall. I'll take the south. Search carefully. Report in a low voice as soon as you find anything. But don't move until we've turned the lights on the floor as a guide. Our flashes together hit the dirt and stone floor under our feet. It was trampled down, but now closely packed, as if by heavy boots. And a fair number of them. The heel marks of freshly stamped rubber were obviously of very recent origin. We parted and ran our lights feelingly over the wall and into every minor cavalet and nook. Not a sign of anything. No catch of weapons or dope or rum or smuggled goods. No hidden machinery. No oil that, it was a thought, might be used for the refueling of submarines. No food chest or cask of liquor. Suddenly Tim cried out softly, Three pieces of candle thrown off here into a corner, he reported. Pick them up. We'll light them and save the torches. Our first investigation finished, we met in the center of the vestibule. How far back did you ever go, Tim? I asked, you and your adventurous young friends. There's an exit in that far wall, Tim replied, but what's beyond that I don't know. In fact, I don't know whether anyone has ever been back there. I went to the rock he'd indicated. Our friends have, I whispered, for on the side of the rock were the scrapings of mud, evidently off shoes the sort of thing that would automatically be left behind when a man went through a narrow passageway. I slipped through and reached out a hand to Tim and Beth. They followed, squeezing their bodies through the narrow opening in the rock and back into the now total darkness. Again we listened with breathless intentness. A far-off rumbling, rushing sound came to our ears. Beth gripped Tim's arm in mine. Underground River, Tim reported with assurance. We used to listen for those sounds when we were kids but still no sound of human inhabitants or workmen, friends, or enemies. I handed Beth a candle and a packet of matches. You've a job, my dear, I said. Light that, and at regular intervals, say every five paces, drop a bit of the melted wax on the ground. If I've read correctly, these caves are likely to have a thousand twists and turns, and blind alleys and diverging corridors. It might be nice to find our way out after we've done exploring. We pushed on slowly. The ugly dirt and stone vestibule had given place to the beginning of a charming cave development. Our flashes picked out the sheen of columns, the beginning of great rock formations that hung above and rose dangerously below us. We marked for remembrance the ones that seemed highly individualized. We pushed on, saving our flashes as much as we could, 
and working ahead in the faulty light of the candles. How easily we human beings grow accustomed to new environments. For a hundred feet or more we fairly crawled along, holding on to one another for the dear security of close association. Then we began to grow almost careless. We pushed ahead with increasing speed. The darkness, which did not yield up the dangers we had expected, became almost our native element. We swung great shadows round us with the twist of a candle, and we saw them come and go with narrow flicker of our nerves. And all the time the faraway roar of the underground river grew clearer, but there was a complete absence of all human sound. Then we came to another small opening. I crushed myself through it into the darkness, and pulled Tim through after me. And just as I was taking from Beth's hand the lighted candle, panic caught at my throat. Before I was conscious of any volition on my part, I had blown out her candle, and we both pulled the girl through into the pitch darkness. No orders were needed to hold us all absolutely silent, listening with all the intensity of tuned harps waiting for a hand to sweep across them. The hand swept, faintly, but in a way that set our concert pitch nerves vibrating in what was not quite terror, yet far more than anticipation. Ahead of us was the unmistakable sound of echoes, human voices, a command of some sort, and then the sound of tapping, sharp, staccato, not in any measured rhythm, but in the business-like blow of a hammer in contact with iron or stone. We stood listening, trying to make head or tail of the noise, frustrated by the realization that if we lit a light now, we would surely be seen by whoever was working far down the stone corridors. What was going on? Where was it going on? What did it mean? But the enveloping darkness was our only answer. We dared not go forward. We were loath to go back. Yet back we went. After all, within the cave, day and night seemed exactly the same. If these were men at work, they might rest during the night. And if we returned then, we might find out what was happening, what was the meaning of this mysterious tapping, this careful development in the underground bed of an ancient river. So back we crawled through the hole and out to the mouth of the cave, replacing the camouflaging as perfectly as we could. The rush of light about us, the smell of the sea and the fresh air, the sense of vastness after the close compression of the cave made us want to sing a little and laugh at nothing. Yet these impulses were driven back by the uncertainty about what might be going on in that cave. Was it all wild goose chase? Were we building mystery and horror out of an innocent ship and its casual crew? We sat there for a while, knowing that something was going on in there that needed our attention, that demanded investigation, that... The little town was in an unexpected flurry of excitement. Even the railroad station was open. Half a dozen officers, we heard, had arrived, and were on their way to the new coastal defenses. The hostess in the tea shop was quite ecstatic. She had lived through World War I, and remembered, but not without considerable prompting, the Spanish-American War. And now once more officers had been dumped into her life. "'And charming young men,' she said, clearly college-bred. Beth pinched the arms of her cavaliers. "'You should never get out of uniform,' she whispered. "'Think how you'd have prostrated this nice thing with your whipcord.' Tim clearly didn't want to prostrate anyone but Beth. I wasn't interested in prostrating anybody anyhow. But on the chance that some of our friends might be among the new arrivals, we headed for the fort. A sentry held us up when we tried to enter. We had no identification with us, so we looked wistfully through the barbed wire and high-voltage fence along which, in the course of time, power would protectingly flow. We had a sense of vast structural activities beyond. Flat cars on which mysterious monsters lay swatched in heavy canvas told us that the big guns had begun to arrive. One huge building in the center was clearly the future ammunition dump. No doubt of it, we were getting ready, and rapidly ready, to present any invading enemy with a reception he would not forget in a hurry, nor regard with any degree of enthusiasm. Back we swung the car into town. It was getting on toward dusk, and Tim drove slowly, thoughtfully. "'How about a cool drink?' he suggested, suiting his action to his own suggestion by swinging up toward the wooden sidewalk before the Greeks. "'Fine,' I replied. As I was about to follow, out of the Greeks, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, walked a fellow in the nondescript clothes of a farmer or mechanic. He took a swift look at us, then, as if he recognized the car— or us, he put his hand over his face to hide an artificial cough, and turned away down the street. "'That's the fellow!' I almost gasped. No doubt of it. It was the sailor who had been tinkering with the useless engine on the deck of the ship. 
It was the fellow whom we had treated to the end of a wrench when we went through the ship. So he had not gone with the rest when the ship departed. Beth picked out the essential element we had missed. Look, she said, pointing after him, his boots are heavily caked with mud. It was the same dark, thick, gummy mud with which our shoes had been covered when we emerged from the cave. I think I see it, said Tim. I honestly believe I see that part of the puzzle. At least that. We had both seen it. Only Beth, who knew few of the details of our private adventures, had to be brought up to date. But Tim was talking on. Suppose that cave doesn't end abruptly but runs on and on. Suppose it cuts under the river that flows through the town. Suppose it travels as far as the coastal defense fortress. Suppose that right under the munition thump, the building erected to hold shells enough to drive back a fleet, ammunition enough to riddle an invading armada of planes, high explosives were installed. With wire stretching back to the point of electrical contact, I supplemented. We all sat silent. That would be horrible, Beth said at last, with a shudder we both felt. And I think Beth and I could feel Tim set his shoulders in a determination that both of us knew to be deep and unshakable. How perfectly, I was thinking aloud, that cave might be laid out for sapping. A tunnel all undercut, ready and waiting for the installation of high explosive and contact fuse. Just a simple job of stringing wire, dumping TNT, and when the right moment came. The dramaphone wire that had seemed without purpose now became full of meaning. Tim stepped on the accelerator. Let's go, he cried. But just as he swung into low, the sheriff down the street rushed out of his little office, looked up and down the street, and waved wildly at us. What's that mean? I asked, expressing the question in all of us. Tim swung the car toward the waving sheriff, who stood breathless and red, with some badly bottled emotion. You, he cried, you, the two of you. That clearly meant us men. Quick, come inside. It was three of us, not two, who responded, following the sheriff into his office. Two men in topcoats turned from the window as we entered, looking at us with that abnormal quiet that seems to characterize really good detectives. There are the two, I mean the three, who found the body, the sheriff panted. And these, he indicated the two men almost proudly, are FBI. Of a sudden I had a sense of peril for ourselves, as well as for the mysterious object of the archer's arrows, the sapper's dynamite. For if they had discovered the wound in the dead man's side, if they knew that the case involved murder, we, in our capacity of amateur sleuths, might be held for suppressing evidence. I saw that Tim had the same intuition. An old, old suspicion that the dead man was no tramp came back with a rush. I took over and told the operators all the details of the death, all except my suspicion that that was the man who had visited Tim's uncle and that Tim had found an arrow barb in the dead man's heart. I'd wait, I argued with myself, until they asked us about the wound. Thanks, said the taller and older of the operatives. Now we'll go see the body. Are you through with us? I asked. Come along, he said sharply, and I knew that this time we were going to be witnesses of no casual examination. The sheriff led us down the street, talking a steady flow, mostly about the new morgue and how well it kept bodies that were placed there. The FBI men said exactly nothing as far as I can recall, just plodded along with their slouch hats pulled far forward and the air of being remote from any world of dead men and sheriffs and material witnesses. I haven't been here since we laid him out, apologized the sheriff. Mostly I leave that sort of thing to the coroner, Dr. Sweet. But you will want to look him over yourself, I'm sure, and so. He swung open the door and flashed on the light. We were looking into a small room, white-tiled, air-conditioned, and clean as the top of a big executive's desk. Now right over there on the slab, said the sheriff, and stopped. The slab toward which he had instinctively pointed was as bare as the hand that gestured. If ever the dead tramp had rested there, he rested there no longer. The FBI operatives looked not in the least surprised. Instead they looked straight at Tim and myself. That was, as I'm sure you can see, said the top man of the two, no tramp. But he double-crossed, I guess, once too often. He used to be claw of the Gestapo. Then, in a fit of repentance, he was stool pigeon for the FBI. Of course it was murder. And now the corpus delecti is gone. You gentlemen would, I think, be doing your country a favor if you told us anything that, because, for example, you thought it irrelevant, you didn't tell us before. 
Yes, said Tim. He was murdered. Neither of the men showed any more surprise than if he had commented on the weather. How? the leader asked. With an arrow, said Tim. Haven't you a lot more than that to tell us? the FBI man asked quietly. We saw that we'd better tell all we knew, all that is except the fact that we somehow felt the uncle's connection with what was happening. So we skipped, as not proved the man's visit to the house. We told the rest and waited to see exactly what would happen to us. Very foolish young men, said one of the FBI men quietly, especially for army officers. No time to be playing correspondence school detectives these days. But, he smiled, I still believe that perhaps you have some plan in mind in which we might all collaborate. I had. I knew that Tim would fall in instantly. And feeling utterly relieved at this chance to redeem ourselves, I offered it to the listening operatives. Good, was all they said, and we shook hands. The car cut around the sea wall slowly. We were all deep in our thoughts, and the preludes to the plan that we'd sketched out with the operatives. Said Beth at long last, after we had passed the cove and were nearing our favorite clump of trees on the little promontory, if ever our guardian angels had a job to do, it's during these next few hours. We parked, as usual, turned off the ignition, and sat thinking. Then Beth's guardian angel did get on the job. Come on, she cried, pointing to the field of late goldenrod behind the cliff. I'm getting an armful for that living room of ours. If we must have mystery and murder, let's have it in an atmosphere of cheerful living. And since none of us has hay fever... She pushed him from behind the wheel and climbed out of the car. I followed, opened the pocket knife I always carry, and in a few minutes we were cutting the long golden flowers into generous bunches. Until... That roar that sounded seemed low and hidden, as if it was packed with some sort of noise deadener. But it was unnatural enough, and close enough to make us wheel about. Indeed, the very earth under our feet rocked. Just a slight rock, but menacing, frightening, as if shuddering from a nearby explosion. Even as we watched, the little promontory staggered. Our car slithered dizzily and drunkenly. The clump of trees sagged away from us with a final lurch, and trees, earth, car, and all disappeared almost as if in slow motion, to fall with an unseen splash into the sea below. Tim leaped forward, but I grabbed him, and holding Sveth's hand with my free hand, we dashed away from the scene. What happened? Beth managed to demand brokenly. They know we come this way. They've watched us park there to talk. They mind the promontory. And when they heard the rumble of our wheels above them, and knew that we had come to a pause, they let off the explosive. If they probably argued, we happened to be in the car. We'd all drown in the deep water at the base of the cliff. If we were not in the car, at least we'd be too frightened to come back that way again. For we were supposed to believe that the road had been washed out by the storm. We were not meant to guess that the promontory fell by the work of man. And if we hadn't known the rest of the plans, we never should have guessed. Right, let's keep running for it, I cried. We ran. But for all her breathlessness, I heard Beth say, in what was an unusual, but nonetheless heartfelt prayer, Dear good guardian angel, thanks so much for being on the job. End of chapter 7 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 8 of Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord S.J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 8 As we quietly opened the hall door and slipped inside, we saw standing before the lighted logs the figure of the valet. His voice was very hoarse. Where's your car? he demanded. Is it your business? Tim shot back. But I, bent on antagonizing him no more than necessary, explained in what was certainly considerably less than the truth engine trouble. We'll go back and take a look at it in the morning. His voice was grindingly ironical. Your uncle was worried, he said, as if he conferred the uncle on all three of us. He is so interested in your welfare and with the archer abroad. I faced him from a vantage point on the lowest step of the stairs. What do you know of a tramp that wasn't a tramp, and an arrow that wasn't shot from a bow? The valet's look was a deliberate insult. I gave up answering riddles when I was seven years old, he said, 
and before I could think of a fitting retort, he had melted into the swinging door that always seemed to devour him without its opening. Tim and I were busy before dinner, planning our course to the last detail. We carefully laid out dark golf clothes. From our bags we took our officer's sidearms, went over them carefully, and slipped them under the mattress, where we could get them immediately before we left. Then we dressed carefully for dinner, and strolled down like the two young officers on a vacation that we were supposed to be. The dinner gong brought Madame Leclerc to join us. She was leaning with artistic dignity on the arm of Beth. They both wore evening dress. Indeed, the whole party had taken a very formal turn. Not so the uncle, who was wheeled into the room by the valet. He wore his full, loose dressing gown, in which alone he seemed to be completely comfortable. He waved us to our places, but not until the three of us had flaunted our grace in his face. Then, while Madame Leclerc released the reservoir of her speech, he kept clinging first at us, and then out into the gathering dusk, the restless lightning of his nervous glances. If he wasn't a very nervous, frightened, worried man, I missed my diagnosis. Once he shot at Tim unexpectedly, tensely. Where were you this afternoon? Calling at the fort, Tim answered, with once more an adequate truth. Again the uncle forced himself into a brief pan of patriotism. How fine and secure we rest, he said stiltedly, insincerely, in the protection of that fortress. No foreign foe dare touch our shores, thank the stars. America is at last awake, at last awake. His oration seemed to thin off into banal repetitions. As overtoned to his talk, there was the endless obligato of the prima donna's thought-empty chatter. I know we sat waiting for the coming of the archer, but there was no sight of him. I know that we were torn between relief and regret. Warm as the night was, the uncle had insisted that the long windows be closed and locked. That may have thwarted the archer, though I doubted it. He had, I believe, a way of passing through such things as closed doors and barred windows. After dinner, the valet reappeared to wheel the uncle back to his apartment, and the rest of us found our way to the big drawing room. Madame Leclerc sang a little in that relic of a voice of hers. Tim and Beth danced to the music of the recording machine, there being nothing suitable on the radio, and I sat and smoked and planned a little more carefully for the night. We retired at eleven with the elaborately insincere good nights of people acting their respective roles. I saw from my window the splash of light that fell from the uncle's apartments, and after going through the careful routine of undressing, I crawled into bed, mustered as completely as I could, crawled out again, put on my golf togs, slipped the automatic into a shoulder holster, tried my flash with a fresh battery against the palm of my hand, and sat down to smoke and wait. Our time was set for a quarter after twelve. Hardly had the hall clock chimed its warning than I was out in the hall. Tim's door opened, and he emerged. As I joined him down the hall, Beth's door opened, too. She stood for a second, waiting for us to join her. "'No soap,' said Tim, facing her half angrily. "'You are not included in this party tonight.' "'That's what you think,' Beth retorted, so softly, but so emphatically, that a new discussion would be wasted." Tim's protest was silenced as she put one hand over his mouth. Then for the briefest second she was gone, to return carrying, of all things in the world, her bow. As she turned, I noticed that under her soft, ample cloak was a clear outline of a quiver. "'What in the world?' demanded Tim, and in answer she swung open her cloak. How she managed it, I don't know. Woman's magic, of course, but out of what were on closer inspection, a pair of slacks and a loose blouse— she had fashioned what, for all the world, looked like the costume of the archer himself. Or was it the archer's own uniform? She read the flash of doubt in my face. She dipped into her quiver and held out an arrow. Not red, you see, she answered. I'm still a counterfeit, not the original. From her belt she pulled a soft hat, held it up for a moment until we silently admired the cocky feather, and then thrust it back into its hiding place. We stole down the stairs, out of doors, into the deepest shadow, over our cliff, until we stood before the magnificently camouflaged entrance to the cave. Tim and I shed our cloaks, Beth held hers tightly around her, and we slipped through the narrow entrance and into the musty blackness beyond. This time we knew what to look for, and we soon found it. 
We moved close to the wall until the light of our flash revealed what we sought, the end of an electrical connection, carefully hidden in a crevice, but joined immediately to bright, shining copper wire. All that would be needed would be contact with a battery, a release of the spark, and along that copper wire could flow death and destruction to the fort above. Now our task of finding our way through the cave was much simplified. I caught the wire with my thumb and finger, gave my left hand to Tim, who held Beth's hand in his right, and we followed, slowly, almost painfully, but none the less surely the wire that was stretched carefully along the wall. At intervals we stopped to flash a light briefly. The wire was leading us, and giving us a sense of certainty that almost nothing else could have given us. We slipped out of the main vestibule and into the secondary corridor. Around us, as before, were the sounds of the underground river, and the drip, drip, drip of water falling from the tessellated roof. I flashed my light reassuringly, and then extinguished it again. I have never had much faith in what the motion picture people call the double take. You know, the way the characters have of looking at something, not seeing it, turning away, realizing that they have seen something without recognizing it, and looking back in a swift, darting glance of recognition. Well, I believe in it now. Precisely that is what I did. Among the rocks was a long mound covered with a canvas. I had seen it without seeing it. I had turned away and doused my light, and even as I did, I had known that I must look again. The second flash of my light brought us all to attention. Carefully, almost daintily, I played the golden light along the length of the canvas. None of us needed to ask what it was. Beth hung back a bit, but we men pushed forward, eagerly, fired with that fierce curiosity that men feel for the dead. I slipped back the canvas. It was the dead, all right. There, cold, immobile, but deader seeming than when first we had discovered him, lay the body of our tramp. So that's where they took him, Tim muttered. They must be rushed, I argued, if they didn't take time out to bury him, if they just left him here while they worked ahead. Couldn't it almost mean, asked Beth, that they are near the end of their work and could let his burial wait until their work is finished? Smart girl, patted Tim, and though I had not precisely the complete approval of the young woman that he had, I knew that she had hit on something very probable. Let's speed, I ordered. Finding the copper wire once more, I led them on our torturous way. What a torturous way it was, over rough rocks, around damp, cold stone columns, up to narrow openings, through which we had to find a difficult way, up steep inclines, down sharp declivities, on and on past the point where we had stopped on our first visit, into a corridor completely new to all of us. Once we paused for light, I felt Tim loosen the gun in his holster. I followed suit. The cold feel of that butt was reassuring. The good old equalizer, Damon Runyon calls it, a not unflattering name. All the while I kept my eyes glued on my wristwatch. We were working with time for our other consideration, for we had figured with the FBI men as closely as possible the time when we would reach a point near the outlet of the cave. They were to be waiting there when we drove, or if we drove, our victims into the open. Yet I had lost all sense, not of time, but of distance. How far had we crawled? How much tunnel still remained? We had listened too intently, and caught no responsive sound of human activity, only the rush of the river, the wearisome drip of the falling drops of water. Another narrow opening, which brought us into damp, dark clay up to our shoe tops, and we emerged on the other side, where we heard the unmistakable sounds for which we had been waiting, that rhythmic tapping once more. Now we knew what it meant, the hammer driving into the rock wall, the supports of the copper wire. Then we heard the low sound of voices, and as we turned a sharp corner, a distant light flashed. There they were, still far off, but across what seemed like a great auditorium. For probably at this point, we figured, under the munition warehouse above the cave widened into a vast room. It was beautiful as the faint dream of a fairy castle, for the light by which at the far end the three men were working reflected from the crystal and rock and quartz that ornamented ceiling and walls and floor. Along the sides the ceiling was low. It seemed almost as if nature's architect had planned aisles on either side. Then in the center it curved upward, high and vaulting. 
but I could see that above the place where the men stood was a sort of low-hanging balcony, like the one above us. Their heads, seemed in silhouette, seemed almost to touch the roof. Up to that point everything had seemed so simple. Our plan had been as easy as the stalking of our own shadows. Now that we saw our quarries across the room of stone and shadowy darkness, we were completely stumped. Undoubtedly they were armed as well as we were. Undoubtedly they would allow themselves to be taken, only as a last resort. And of a sudden I had a sick feeling that one point in our plan had been overlooked. Quite confidently the FBI men had said they would enter from the far exit of the cave, which was probably somewhere around the fortress. But in the rush of confidence inspired by their presence, we had not first gone with them to look for that exit or entrance. Had they found it? Were they waiting for our cry or our shot, a signal, to close in on the other side? I pulled my two comrades down beside me in the darkness of that natural aisle. From behind a huge boulder we watched the men. They were working like beavers at a breaking dam. Clearly this was the end of their trail, for they were swinging the copper around, bringing it down to the point at which it would eventually be hooked to the high explosive, set no doubt for the moment when next that craft put into the cove, some time after the arsenal was stocked with munitions. I realized as I watched that in a few minutes they would be through, when they would either escape through that far exit, wherever it might be, or retrace their steps and stumble over us, or be lost to us in the infinite variety of shadowy rocks that made its perfect ambush. We had to act, FBI or no FBI, and act at once. Silently but effectively, I motioned Beth and Tim to the safety of some high rocks. Beth slipped behind one, that rose tall, almost in the shape of a thin, pointed cone, and I saw her rest a slim shoulder against it for protection. Now, I whispered to Tim. Then in a loud voice to the minute work, All right, stay right where you are. You're covered and you might as well come quietly. Never before had I seen men move so quickly. Without shadow of doubt, these were not ordinary sailors or workmen, but men trained to raise their fine discipline, skilled to immediate action. Evidently they had been working by the light of strong pocket flashes. Before I could finish my command, long before the bouncing echo had leaped from wall to wall and returned to slap us in the face, their lights were out and the vast hall was plunged into terrifying darkness. I know I groaned. What to do now? Even as we debated, they would be slipping out through the exit, perhaps into the arms of the waiting FBI, but more likely to escape in safety. But that resistless impulse that makes a man pull the trigger of the gun in his hand must have gripped one of the men. There was a blinding flash of light, man-made lightning that filled the cave with an instant brilliance, and with it that terrifying roar of thunder that accompanies a shot indoors. That thunder rolled and echoed paralyzingly around us. Then a second roar of thunder, far, far more terrifying than the first, a thunder that was not only of the rending heavens, but of a torn and tortured earth. That was it exactly, like the noise of an earthquake. Great heavens! Tim shouted at my ear, as the sound rolled and roared and crashed into final silence. What was that? Part of the ceiling collapsed, I hazarded, and even as I said it, there was a wild scream of pain, just one, and then silence. Desperately from behind the shelter of my rock I flashed my light. The picture at the far end of the hall was now entirely changed. One of the galleries, the very one under which the men had stood, was now a hill of rubble. My flash lighted for a moment the still body of one man, pinioned under the broken rock. The repercussion of a shot from a heavy service revolver had broken the delicate balance of the rock and sent it crashing down. On how many of the men? I wished I knew. One thing, though, was more than likely. The falling roof had blocked the exit, preventing the escape of any of the men who might still be alive. But horrible second thought, it had cut off the approach of the FBI men or the sheriff and his party. I hazarded a cry. Come out! I shouted, spacing my words between the rebounding echoes. Tensely we waited for a reply. None came, but we heard noises as of rocks being displaced and scattered by the cautious movement of someone walking or crawling. Come out, I cried, and this time we got an answer. The voice was thick and heavy, blurred by an unmistakable guttural accent. Come and get us before we come and get you. He had said we, 
Was he bluffing? Were there two of them still left? Or had other workers joined them under cover of the darkness? Tim lifted his automatic to fire toward one voice. Don't! Beth cried, catching his arm. She pointed to the low ceiling that poised and balanced above us. Might not a shot from our guns do for our ceiling what the other shot had done for theirs? Might we not, as the result of a single blast, be buried under the rubble of rock that had for centuries been held in suspension, waiting for a fatal shot? The sound of small scattered stones continued. In the tense, echo-responsive air, I could sense movement. Men going or coming, moving towards us to attack, escaping toward an exit of whose existence we did not even know. Suddenly it was Beth who took command. Can you scream as if in fright? she demanded. I nodded. Tim nodded, too. Then you and the men are going to see the skirted archer in his or her ghostly flesh. She dropped her heavy cloak. Even in the darkness against the white of that tall, cone-like protecting pillar of quartz, I saw what was without a doubt a perfect reproduction of the archer. If they are sailors, she whispered, they may not be afraid of bullets. Be sure they'll be afraid of a ghost who shoots red arrows. Red arrows? I echoed in protest, for I remembered clearly that her arrows were yellow, varnished wood. Wait a second, she ordered. Accustomed to the darkness, I could see that she was rubbing lipstick up and down the length of three arrows in her hand. Now, she commanded, taking our rank and authority away from us by the preemptory character of her words, do exactly as I say. I shall step to the right of the court's column. As I do that, both of you flash your lights on me. Scream for all you're worth. Scream, the scarlet archer. I'll shoot once and step back behind the column. Then scream and pretend to struggle in the darkness, as if you were fighting with a ghost. Then flash your lights on me again. A second arrow. I won't let you, protested Tim furiously. I'm sorry, Tim, but you're not in command now. You yielded rank to me thirty seconds ago. Are you ready? Ready, I whispered, and during the next five seconds I poured forth a volume of prayer that never before in my life of faith had I even matched. Now, whispered Beth, jumping to the right of the column. With a single synchronized movement, we men flashed our lights. There she stood, tall, brilliantly lighted, for all the world, the scarlet archer risen from the grave, or the cave, to pour his arrows on our enemies. With a speed I could not have dreamed possible, she whipped an arrow to the bowstring, and sent it speeding from the brilliant golden light across the darkness toward the sounds that indicated the escaping men. The instant she did so, Tim and I, in voice that must have been convincingly high with terror, screamed, The Scarlet Archer! Round and round us rolled the echoes. We extinguished our lights in the instant, and saw Bess slip back behind her protecting column. The echoes died to silence, and then the shower of stones grew heavier and more insistent. The men were frightened all right. Can you in the darkness? I whispered to Beth. Send the shower of arrows their way. She stood there in the black cave, as fearless as if she were on the target range of St. Elizabeth's, and through the air we heard the swish of arrows. They pinged against the rock, but evidently one did not ping, and we heard a quick cry smothered, perhaps by a hand. Let's try the apparition again, Beth breathed into my ear. No, Tim protested, gripping her wrist, but she shook him off. Again. Again we leveled our flashes, waiting for her signal. This time she stepped to the left of the column. Again we flashed our lights. Again she fitted her red arrow and sent it speeding across the hall. Again we screamed in mock, but excellently counterfeited terror. The Scarlet Archer! Back she stepped into the shadow of the column, and I flashed off my light. Then, to my horror, I saw that Tim's flash had not gone off. By one of those fatal accidents that happened to the best of gadgets, his flash stuck. The full blaze of his light lingered on the column behind which Beth was hiding. Perhaps their superstitious fears had blasted their courage. Perhaps a kind of desperation forced their trigger fingers to do the tragic thing they would not, in cold blood, even have considered. I do not pretend to know, and none of us was ever able to ask. But suddenly, across the cave, the men began blasting at us with what were undoubtedly heavy service revolvers. There was a fierce barrage of lightning. There was thunder that deafened us and flung us flat on our stomachs. Then, like the cracking of a planet and the explosion of a star, came the roar of that cave about us. 
This time it was not a single ceiling that seemed to fall, but half a cave, pounding in tons of missiles about the stone floor, shaking the columns back of which we lay, gripping us with a horror that left us paralyzed, unable to do more than wait for the extinguishing of our own lives. But that did not come. With incredible swiftness, the cave lapsed again into silence. A belated rock fell crashing into the blackness. Then a silence that was like the moment of waiting before the general judgment. Almost fearfully, I dared to whisper, Are you all right? Right, answered Tim. And to my infinite relief, Beth broke into sobs. I was glad she was not an Amazon after all. I was glad that her bravery had ended in that womanly flood of tears. I don't think either of us needed to be told that under that rocky avalanche were buried our unknown enemies, whoever they might be. Still we lay there, scarcely daring to breathe in the hideous darkness, until we were sure that no slightest movement was waking the echoes of the cave. Then slowly I played my flashlight across the scene of utter wreckage. The whole far ceiling had caved in. Masses of rocks were piled in a miniature mountain range, under which, we needed no investigation to make it clear to us, they buried three, perhaps more men. The explosive doom they had prepared for others had by the decree of just providence fallen upon themselves. We sat clinging to one another's hands, the darkness and silence almost a relief after the catastrophe, which had destroyed one half of our little underground world, and left the three of us unscathed. I think a prayer of thanksgiving is in order, said Tim. I've already said it, Beth replied. Yet as we were praying again, we heard voices coming from the away by which we had entered the cave, and then the flash of lights. Our first thought was the possible enemies. Our second was the glad reassurance that the FBI men had found us, if they had not found the other entrance. They had found ours, about which we had carefully told them, and they were coming to take us back. The tallest of the men arrived first. Safe? he asked superfluously. We nodded. I found the wire. You were right. And the dead man, too. Where are the others? I think all three of us pointed to the mighty mausoleum that nature herself had erected above them. It's hard to feel otherwise than reverent and overwhelmed in the presence of death, even your enemy's death. We parted at the top of the cliff, the FBI men and the sheriff taking their car back to the village. We three followed the shadowy pathway home. Just as we turned toward the blackness of the hedge, Tim grabbed my arm and pointed. There was a figure in the shadow ahead of us. He was almost dashing toward the house. Only as he came close to the house, he swerved to the side. And in the instant, as his profile came between us and the sky, we knew him. Had he been one of the men in the cave? And had he escaped? Had he been waiting for news of our death, eager to carry it back to Tim's uncle? or what other villainous work had carried him out into the night. We stood watching his movements intently, until he disappeared. Then we walked slowly toward home, in the train of the sinister valet. End of chapter 8 Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 9 of Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 9 When you're watching a play in the theater, you know that as the last curtain rises, you are going to see the climax of the drama. Something like that must come over us humans as we are watching a real life drama. For Tim and Beth and I had the conviction that the day following the night in the cave was going to close our little drama in some climax of comedy or tragedy. In our hearts we prayed that gracious providence, which alone turns life into the mold of a happy ending, would so direct this play, in which we had been taking more or less unwilling parts, that at the end we would find comedy. That was why, in the certainty that the drama would unroll itself, we asked the FBI operatives to give us a full day before they even attempted to search our house or question anyone in it. Expecting the end, we agreed among ourselves that under no circumstances would we leave the place. We resolved to keep watch all through the day on all those who might have something to do with the denouement of our queer, twisted mystery. 
We slept drunkenly, the three of us, until late in the morning. Again we had a calm conviction that nothing would happen in the bright, cheerful hours of the morning. We met at lunch. No sign of our host or the valet. We sat in the window seat after lunch, played a bit of tennis in the early afternoon, walked in the garden, the three of us clinging together as the shadows lengthened. We waited confidently for the night. Beth brought us the only provocative news of the day. "'I have a suspicion,' she said, "'that tonight at dinner your uncle is going to tell us "'that he is engaged to Madame Leclerc.' "'Tim smiled at me wryly. "'And with that announcement,' he said, "'goes my last hope of ever owning Arrow Anchorage.' "'Do you think for a moment,' I demanded, "'that the scarlet archer would let him carry his plans through?' "'Tim fixed me with a grey, puzzled look. "'So you are to think of him as a friend in Alley.' do you? Odd that you should, when to the Urkenwolds he comes as the messenger of death. That ended the discussion. For the rest we could only wait with what patience we could muster. We answered the dinner bell promptly. Madame Leclerc clearly made an entrance, and though she always sat in the seat of the mistress, she now took her place as if it were her established right, as indeed we all believed it was. When the valet wheeled Tim's uncle into the dining room, we could not miss the fact that his dressing gown was wrapped tightly across his knees, and that he evidently did not care who noticed the heavy bulge that indicated the large pistol. The meal proceeded almost silently. For once Madame Leclerc did not talk us into insensibility. Indeed, she seemed to be waiting for someone else to do the talking, perhaps my host, but that he did not do. When the meal was ended, he snarled at the butler. We'll have our coffee here tonight. Bring it in, and you'll clear out. We sat in silence until the coffee had been served, and the butler had closed the door behind him. Then the uncle turned to Tim maliciously. "'I know that you've been living, my fine young fellow, in the hope of my death.' Tim could not hold back a sharp protest. "'Don't interrupt. Don't lie. I hate liars even worse than I do parasites. Well, give up your hope. Madame Leclerc has done me the honor to promise to become my wife, and the date is a week from today.' "'It's I who am honored.' purred the prima donna. I expect to have children, perhaps many children. For once the old man laughed. I am still young. Tim's voice cut in very softly. And hale and hearty, strong enough to walk in the garden at midnight and knock your nephew unconscious. You could have cut the silence with a butter knife. I saw the uncle's eye flick from Tim's face to mine, to Bess, and back to Tim's. You're not only a liar and a parasite, he said at last, in a voice that was blistered with fury, but a fool of the finest water. Tim leaned far back in his chair. I'd never seen him more self-possessed, and this time he was acting a part for which I hadn't seen him rehearse. Some day, Tim said, so quietly we almost had to strain to hear him, I may find out what this is all about. Right now, I am frankly puzzled. But why you, who are perfectly capable of walking, and do walk, should pretend to be a chair in prison invalid. Madame Leclerc punctuated his query with a slight gasp. And why you entertain men who are the bitter enemies of your country, and lend aid to a plan of sabotage that would have wrecked one of our country's defenses. I felt the uncle coiling as a snake would before the strike. And why you drove an arrow into the heart of a man whom you probably knew, and who probably knew you, when you were in Germany, and he was in the Gestapo. That was all. Quite slowly, once more like a cobra in the last movement before its death, Tim's uncle drew from beneath his dressing gown the gun we had seen in clear foreboding outline. It was a clean, blue-black automatic of a caliber I guessed to be in the forties. He did not point it at Tim. He simply laid it on the table with the muzzle in my friend's direction. I need not remind you my fine fellow, that no court in the land would convict me for killing you after what you have just said to me. But I am not in the mood for killing you. I might wound you severely if you stayed. Not enough to end your useless life, but just enough to make you a cripple, too. But I prefer not to do even that. He leaned forward and his voice became vicious, savage, though it was not raised even slightly in volume. Now get out, you and your captain friend, and take the girl with you if you want to. Madam, my future wife will not need her. It will be better to have no priors around the house. Get! 
He waved the gun as accompaniment to his order. Tim rose slowly. He was not afraid. He was just white and sick with fury, enraged at the humiliating way in which he had been treated, and at his hopelessness in the face of his uncle's command. "'It's been pleasant having you,' said the uncle, and then he spat, "'for the last time.' "'Come, Beth,' said Tim. "'Come on, Luke.' We rose, too, and had just turned on our heel when a shout petrified us where we stood. It was a sharp, loud halloo, like the cry of a huntsman in pursuit of a stag, like the cry of a bowman in battle. I know that on a synchronized movement we all swung toward the window. And there, outlined against the sky, walking with his long, clean strides across the top of the hill, was the scarlet archer. "'Once too often,' snarled Tim's uncle, "'once too often.' The archer took his accustomed place, and shot an arrow high into the air. Then he did an unaccustomed thing. He stepped down off the rise, and started with measured strides across the lawn and in our direction. "'Just once too often,' muttered the uncle again, and I saw him lift the automatic, steady it with his arm upon the table, and take careful aim. Using his elbow for a pivot, the uncle swung the muzzle of the gun on a straight line with Tim's stomach. A man may shoot an armed intruder on his property, he said with quiet intensity, or the man who tries to help that trespasser. Tim fell back, for he knew as well as I did that nothing would have given his uncle greater joy than to put the first bullet into him. Again the gun swung toward the advancing archer, but even as it did there was a whiz and a smack, and a vibrating red arrow buried itself in the wood paneling. Tim's uncle fired. The distance could not have been more than fifty yards, and his gun was held as steadily as if it were set in a concrete emplacement. But the archer merely fitted another arrow to his bowstring and kept advancing. Thirty yards away. The uncle fired again. The archer answered with an arrow that ripped through a candle flame and buried itself in the arm of the uncle's chair. Again the uncle fired, this time over the shorter range. It was almost comic under its fierce tenseness, this duel between the ghostly archer and the man armed with the latest type of automatic. Ghostly archer? Clearly he was a ghost, for the bullets aimed point-blank at his heart left him utterly unscathed. Even as he approached us, I had the horrible feeling that at length my ambition was answered, and into the room with me would be marching a man risen from the grave. Again the repercussion of that powerful gun again another arrow in the chair. Then, forgetting all pretense, Tim's uncle rose. He stood tall and strong and unwavering in front of his chair, as the archer stood in the doorway. At this arisen figure, the archer leveled a scarlet arrow. At the breast of the archer, the uncle leveled the automatic. Then he blasted, keeping his finger on the trigger and letting the clip empty itself into the body of the archer. I could not turn my eyes away from the certain massacre. Yet I was not surprised, not dumbfounded that the bullets raked him and left him untouched. In the dim light of the candles he seemed to toss aside all thought of death, he that perhaps had been dead of long five centuries. With a wild howl Tim's uncle hurled the empty gun at the figure, now standing, legs apart, bow uplifted, in the archway of the dining room. I heard a crash as the useless gun found a pane of stained glass in the door, and then I saw the uncle turn to flee. None of us moved. None of us could think of anything worth doing. It was a battle to the death between the two men, and I knew, despite all the persuasions of science, who would be the victor. For as the uncle rounded the table, his dressing gown now flying behind him, an arrow wanged, and he stopped dead. It had cut through his loose gown and fastened him to the paneling. He wheeled, no cripple surely, to pull the arrow away. And as he did so, his robe spread wide, his back to the hall, he faced his enemy. Then a rain of arrows flew across the room, and almost before we knew it, the uncle was pinioned to the wall, arrows outlining his figure, his dressing gown holding him prisoner. In the doorway, the archer stood with one quiet arrow pointed straight at the old man's heart. Then, for the first time, he spoke. Thou damsel, he said, deeply, politely, art, I will scribe. Beth got it. She nodded. Who of us was able to talk? Get thee parchment and a quill. I would dictate. Leave it to that girl. 
she slipped away and before we had time to shift our positions she returned with a block of linen paper in her hand shoot she said in slang that i thought most inappropriate if you dare do a thing that blackguard asked cried tim's uncle then he stopped it seemed as if the right hand of the archer drew the bent bow tauter still her quill upon that paper said the archer or my arrow in thy heart he seemed to shrug forsooth a simple choice tim's uncle cursed in mad futility tis well damsel proceed right as i bid thee there we stood dumb images around that table as the archer dictated in this amazing fashion i henry forsyth argenwold being of sound mind and body albeit most uncomfortable right now maiden thou mayest skip that ultimate do hereby swear and proclaim as follows. I did with malice of intent defraud Lieutenant Timothy Erkenwold of his lawful inheritance. I did forge the will purporting to be that of my late brother. I have neither right nor title to his properties or holdings, least of all to error anchorage, and I hereby willingly renounce them all in favor of the lawful heir. The archer for the first time took me into account. Release him, he said. He will sign. Never, cried the uncle, never so long as I live. This is a filthy trick, a dirty, cowardly game on an old cripple. I think I laughed. I know that I pulled out the arrows almost with regret. When the last was out, the uncle with a strength I never could have guessed he had, caught me around the waist and held me as his shield. So, he cried, now shoot if you must and kill him first, this interfering soldier and using me as a screen he moved toward the door pulling me despite my struggles along the back wall i heard a bowstring twang and in the intervening fraction of a second i set myself for death instead i heard a howl of pain as the uncle dropped me i stepped away and in the back of his hand was a scarlet arrow agree with me to hurt e'en so foul a wretch as thou art now sign my hand moaned the uncle tis but thy left one thy right is well fitted for the best deed it has ever done. And as if he had really spitted him on the point of the fresh arrow now in his bow, the archer guided the uncle around to the paper on which Beth had written. Not worth a pinch of salt in law, he snarled. We'll see at the assizes, said the archer. Captain Foster and Madame Leclerc, ye be the witnesses thereof. We signed. I most willingly... Madame Leclerc with a last dramatic gesture, as if she were close to curtain time. Suddenly the archer swept into the room. He picked up the paper, not with his hand, but by thrusting the point of his arrow through it. "'Tis done, tis done. For once the archer of Agincourt brings not death, but life." "'Damn you, damn you all!' cried Tim's uncle. And then without warning he bolted across the door, sped out onto the lawn, and headed for the garage and the cars. In the excitement we forgot all about the archer, forgot everything but the flight of this helpless cripple. We saw him swing the powerful car out of the garage, down the road, and up the lane toward the hill beyond which lay the sea wall. Across the lawn we raced, Tim, Beth, and I, forgetting everything in this purposeless chase of a man who meant nothing to us, unless, of course, we were impelled by that strange intuition which presages death. Like mad he cut down the road, like mad he mounted the hill. He swung the car onto the narrow path by the sea, and then we heard a scream, a sound of falling earth, and the crash of a heavy body hitting the water. The promontory, I cried. He didn't know that they had blown out the road in the promontory. Back we dashed to the house. I into the reception hall to phone for help. Tim at my elbow. We got the village garage with difficulty, and the promise of immediate help and then we rushed into the dining room. A chair had been moved to the uncle's place, and in it, sipping coffee, as if he were the master of the house, sat the archer, a dignified, youngish man, who smiled up at us as we entered. That he was in short sleeves, provided the only incongruous touch. "'Hello, Tim,' he cried in welcome. Tim stopped in the doorway as if he had been struck, and then, in a leap, he was across the room and in the man's arms. Chris, he cried, my brother Chris, and they told me you'd been killed. 
With chains and infinite labor, we pulled the car out of the sea. But the uncle was dead, drowned in the closed automobile. So we buried him quietly with the Erkenwolds, among whom he rightly had no place. And Chris said sadly, The scarlet archer did foretell death after all. I wish it had been life for all of us. Yes, even for him. Little by little we pieced the story together. How his uncle had planned the hunt for the sole purpose of leaving him dead in the jungle. How he had almost succeeded, had not Providence, in the person of a kind old negro chieftain, found the young man and nursed him back to health. But why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you let us know at once? Tim protested. Because I knew that uncle was a murderer, and that it was my unsupported word against his. He could say I dreamed it all in delirium, and I had no way of proving that he had tried to kill me. Besides, I thought it was a swell job to get into his confidence and win a confession or profit by a slip. So I located him in Germany. He had stayed on after his recovery. You remember the Englishmen and Americans who in the early days of Hitler's regime fell captive to the dictator's charm? Uncle was one of them. Only he never recovered. Hitler was precisely his type. So when I found him in Germany... Amazing how the rapid events of the night had driven the most normal thoughts from our minds. I leaped to my feet. Tim, I cried, if you spend a night in this house without firing that valet, as far as Coast Guard gun could shoot a shell. Chris laughed, for Tim, too, was on his feet, grim purpose in his face. Don't bother, unless you want to lose your brother again. We looked at him in bewilderment. That's precisely it, my lad. I was the valet, too. I know we sat down with a thud that shook the chairs that held us. That's the point. You remember how I loved amateur theatricals as a youngster? Well, I rigged up that character the valet. I hired myself to my uncle as his attendant. I followed him all over Europe and came back with him to America. I watched over Dad as well as I could. As for that matter, I tried to watch over you harebrained kids. That's why you almost caught me last night and why you found me up when you came back from your wild expeditions. I was worried sick for you, and for Dad, too. And yet... Well, Dad died suddenly, you remember. I saw this fellow forge the will. How could I prove it? Again, it was my word against his. So again I waited. I rushed to a protest. But I saw the archer, who was you, on the hill at the very time that the valet, who was also you, was sleeping in his bed. Chris laughed. I'm surprised you were caught with that one, he laughed. You've no idea what a lot of costume that really was. So when the wig was laid on the pillow, and the hump placed under the sheet. Go on, I said, and I was frankly embarrassed. Later he took us to the summer house and showed us the trap door that none but the elder son knew of. Down that, I've heard, said Chris. One of the early Erkenwolds went to court the daughter of the porter. I'm glad to say they married though a younger son got the property as a consequence. That's why the passageway runs through another of those very convenient ocean caves straight to the porter's house. But to come back to his story. Then, one night, I realized that he was involved in fifth columnist activity. Men came, and he sent me away and locked his door. One of them was a tramp he killed here in the living room. They laid their simple plan, and all he had to do was furnish the coverage for them. No one would suspect an American of cooperating, and the explosive could lie there until such time as the fort was ready. Then detonate it below the munitions dump. The explosive would blow the whole fortification to bits, possibly just as an enemy fleet came sailing down the coast. Only one of the conspirators went sour. He double-crossed the Gestapo. Then he double-crossed Uncle. Then he threatened to tell the FBI what he knew. So Uncle killed him with the thing that was handiest, the arrow I had shot and despite his fake crippled condition, he managed to get the tramp to the cliff. But he forgot that ledge of rock. That was the thing that upset his plans, the little guidance by which a fallen body was dropped, not into the sea, but upon a conspicuous shoulder of rock. When I saw him destroy the chapel, I knew he was a superstitious man. Working on that, I planned to frighten him, as ultimately he was frightened. Only, Tim, you got in the picture, and that confused issues considerably. I had planned to play a lone hand, except that I found you were working with me all the time. But I saw him shoot you, I cried, with a gun in which I had substituted blanks. 
So that's the story, Tim, and we're spared the scandal of a trial. The guilty men were, after all, dealt with by the supreme judge. And arrow anchorage is yours, said Tim gratefully. What's mine is yours, his brother replied, and since I'm going into the army, too, we can share it together. All four of us, said Tim. Beth looked at her hands. We hadn't noticed that she wore Tim's big class ring on her significant finger. Congratulate me, said Tim. When we get to town, she'll have a rock. Don't say rocks to me again, cried Beth. And though we all laughed, we shuddered, too, as we had a second memory of possible death under a falling wall of stone. As for me, I suppose it was really better than a holiday. But if you happen to know of an authentic ghost, will you be good enough to let me know? I still want to see one. End of Chapter 9 Recording by Maria Therese End of Red Arrows in the Night by Daniel A. Lord S. J.